Are we rolling already? Yeah. Okay. Say something again. I am Stephen Fagan, being interviewed at long last. <laughs> Sounds good. After sitting in on 24 other interviews, I'm, it's my turn now. To give you all the answers, the truth now. <laughs> all these questions and more will be answered. All right, shoot. Did you watch some? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. I've seen Soap Dish, that Robert Downey movie, Robert Downey Jr., Kevin Klein movie. That was pretty funny. Well, they used to always ask a bunch of questions. They had to say, all these questions and more will be answered on the next episode of Soap Dish. Oh. <laughs> but they would. They just the <laughs> uh, you can start off, tell me your name, where you live, and what you do. Uh, my name is Stephen Fagan. I live in Mesquite, Texas, right outside of Dallas, and I am the oral history coordinator at the Sixth Form Museum at Dealey Plaza. And how did, uh, well, first start with your education. What is your educational background? Uh, well, I've lived in uh, Dallas, Mesquite, all my life. Uh, I went to uh, Mesquite schools and uh, went to SMU for four years and uh, got a Bachelor of Arts majoring in uh, history and English with a specialization in creative writing. And I graduated in May of 2001, just a, just a couple of years ago. And I was an intern here at the museum uh, during my last year at SMU, uh, working specifically in the oral history uh, department. And um, they, they liked my work. I came in and did a lot of transcriptions and uh, helped with the interviews. and kind of helped organize the, the program a little bit and so uh, right after graduation they, they hired me on full-time and, and created the position of oral history coordinator. They had never had anyone full-time to manage the collection before and so they brought me on to do that. How did you find out about the internship in the first place? Uh, that's, that's kind of an interesting story. Um, a newsletter came to my parents house uh, from SMU talking about various internships that were available and one of the ones they mentioned was an internship at the Sixth Form Museum and I've had a lifelong interest in the, the Kennedy assassination and so my mom immediately showed that to me and it, and it got my attention and so I called up one of my professors um, Dr. Glenn Linden who I knew had been on the original board of uh, directors here at the museum and I asked him do you know anything about this and so he called up Jeff West the executive director and they did some checking around and no one at the museum knew anything about this internship. It was, it was something that had been worked out with, with someone who was no longer at the museum and hadn't bothered to tell anyone about it. So everyone was kind of clueless at both ends. And, um, and so really I was just kind of this, this eager young history student who knew a lot about the assassination. I came in and talked to uh, Ruth Ann Rugg, the director of interpretation, and um, she seemed to take a liking to me and so they kind of created this internship for me uh, so I could work with the oral histories. And they, uh, they brought me on almost immediately, and I, I served in that capacity for about a year. Um, so tell me about how, you, how your interest began in this whole subject. Well, it, it started out when I was really young. My, my mom was a, a second grade student in Mesquite schools at the time of the assassination and uh, she vividly recalls her memories of, of what happened when the, when the assassination took place, when they came and announced that the president had been shot. And um, I don't want to say she was traumatized by the event, but she was greatly affected by it. She was at that impressionable young age. And I can relate to that because I was in the first grade later on when, when the Challenger exploded and I had kind of a, it had a similar impact on me. But, but, but back to the assassination, she she had this um, unique fascination with the event because she was so young at the time it happened and so as she grew up she began to get all the books and really study the, the event and uh, she got the Warren Commission report when the, when the volume, the summary volume came out in 1964 and she started getting all the conspiracy books and building up this vast library and um, today she has close to 250, 300 books in her collection, which almost rivals the library we have here at the museum. Um, but as a toddler and growing up, I was just exposed to that and vicariously I had this interest in history anyway. And so I just started looking at these books and, and learning about the assassination. Um, 
as gruesome as it sounds, I watched the Zapruder film as probably a three or four year old, and so I developed this this you know unique interest in it, and um, I think the fact that it occurred here in my city really affected me and uh, made me want to study it even more, and so I just became very familiar with the with the history of the events and the people, the eyewitnesses. I started learning their names and where they were, and slowly but surely, I kind of became this amateur encyclopedia of the assassination and uh, little did I know I didn't think it would ever serve me any purpose but here I here I am now uh, doing what I do and so I'm, I'm glad it I'm glad it was used for something you tell me um, the story of your, the story that your mom told you about that day uh, she was sitting in class and uh, I it was either an announcement over the loudspeaker or it was either her teacher telling the class. I kind of get my mom and my dad's stories confused because they were both in schools. My dad was in Dallas schools. My mom was in Mesquite, which is just a suburb of Dallas. And um, they both announced that the president had been shot. What I remember about my mom's story is that she vividly recalls uh, kids in her class cheering, uh, which has become kind of a, you know, a myth of the assassination. Um, uh, Dan Rather went on the news that night and talked about children in Dallas cheering, uh, hearing word that uh, the president had been shot and you know that, that's been denied over and over again but my, my mom says it was true. She said there were a few kids in her class that kind of said yay, you know, not, not uh, you know, standing up and applauding but they were kind of, uh, kind of cheering a little bit probably because they, they had heard Kennedy bad mouth at home or things like that. Mesquite was and still is an extremely conservative city and, uh, and so she remembered that but she she and I, we, we come from a long line of uh, Democrats, and so uh, she always liked Kennedy, and, uh, and so she was really affected by it. And she went home that night, and uh, she just remembers being very, very scared. Uh, she, as a child, of course, she, she felt like they were coming after her. And uh, um, I, think, I think she, I remember her telling me it was the first time in her life that she felt insecure because she always talks about how they would leave their windows open and they'd leave their doors unlocked, how it was such a safe world. You know, you think of the idyllic 50s, you know, Disneyland and Eisenhower, and this was the start of something totally different for her. She felt insecure, she felt afraid, and I think that was the first time in her life that she felt that. Okay. <laughs> so people keep telling me you know, how young Kennedy was, but how young was he when he got elected? Kennedy was 43 years old when he was elected president. He was the youngest president elected. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was younger than Kennedy, but ironically enough, he became president when William McKinley was assassinated, the uh, president assassinated before Kennedy in 1901. And uh, so Kennedy was the youngest president ever elected, and he was also the first Catholic. How close was the election? The election was very close, uh, very similar to what we just had in, uh, in 2001. Um, the, uh, Kennedy defeated Nixon by less than 1% of the vote, and uh, there, there's, there's always been a great deal of controversy surrounding that. Um, some people say that, that Nixon really won. Just like, you know, the, the, any time there's, there's a vote that's that close, there's going to be people that say, you know, the other guy, the other guy won. But there, there were specific charges of voting fraud in both Texas and Illinois. Um, Nixon could have demanded a recount. Um, I believe Eisenhower and some other folks, um, you know, encouraged him to demand a recount. But for whatever reason, he didn't. Um, there was no precedent for anything like that. It could have plunged the government into chaos. And, uh, and so for whatever reason, he, he chose to... Um, to accept the vote as it was, and, and Kennedy was elected. Um, what about the controversy over Kennedy writing or not writing Profiles in Courage? Profiles in Courage was um, the book that got Kennedy a Pulitzer Prize, and uh, there, there has always been some controversy over whether or not he really wrote that book or whether he kind of guided a team who wrote that. Uh, specifically, his speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, has been um, said to have maybe ghostwritten that book for Kennedy, 
uh, the accusation really started about a year after the publication of the book when ABC ran a program making that that statement that Kennedy really didn't write the book. Uh, a week later that claim was retracted on air um, and so since then that controversy just kind of existed out there. Uh, I don't think we'll ever really know. Um, there are handwritten notes from Kennedy, there, there are handwritten manuscripts um, and of course Kennedy always always said that he wrote the book. Um, I don't know for sure, but I do know that there's always been some controversy about that. Um, can you tell me kind of the overview of the Texas trip, where he was going mm -hmm. and what the further plans were? Uh, Kennedy came to Texas in 1963 probably for two reasons. Uh, one was that he had lost Texas in 1960 in the 1960 election, I think. Did he? <laughs> Let's see, hang on. Well, you can skip the reason if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I th I'm pretty sure he did. But anyway, hang on. Yeah, Kennedy, Kennedy came to Texas um, in 1963 for two reasons. One, he was uh, kind of launching his campaign for his reelection. And also, he was trying to mend this political break that had occurred in the Democratic Party. Uh, there, there was kind of a split between the conservative Democrats and the liberal Democrats in Texas, uh, specifically Ralph Yarborough and uh, John Connolly, Lyndon Johnson. There was, a, there was a split there and Kennedy kind of came down to men fences as it, as it was. Um, it, was a, it was a very brief trip. It was a five city tour. Uh, they flew down from Washington to San Antonio on November 21st and Kennedy uh, dedicated an Aeronautics Medical Center that day, and then they went to uh, Houston and uh, I think had a fundraising dinner, um, and then that evening they, they flew to Fort Worth, and uh, they arrived just, I think, before midnight on the 21st, and they spent the night in Fort Worth. On the last day of his life, November 22nd, he woke up in, um, in Fort Worth. He gave a uh, speech in front of the Hotel Texas. Um, to a, to a crowd of admirers there and then went inside and made a brief appearance at a Chamber of Commerce breakfast, he and, and Jacqueline Kennedy, and then they uh, got in the, uh, the cars and headed to the airport and then took a very brief flight uh, to Love Field in Dallas and um, they got in the motorcade there and of course headed downtown to, uh, to what happened there. Um, if everything had worked out, which of course it didn't, he would have gone to the Dallas Trademark made a speech there and then the party would have gone back to Love Field and flown to Austin for a fundraising dinner that night and then it would have been back to Washington from there. And, uh, can you tell me kind of more specifically on the, the freight route coming from Love Field? I mean, not every detail. Right. Um, the uh, the parade route was was it was a it was a typical route um, through downtown that got you onto Stimmons Freeway. Uh, you went down Lemon Avenue and, and Harwood, and that kind of took you right into the heart of downtown. And uh, once you once you reached that point, you had Harwood, and then there was a turn onto Main Street, and then you were really in the heart of the downtown business district in Dallas. And then the crowds were just uh, incredible. I mean, it's it's there's never been an official count, but it was estimated that almost 200,000 people were out to see the president that day, which was uh, extremely surprising considering the, the kind of uh, conservative atmosphere in Dallas at that time. There, there was some concern among the um, business and civic leaders in the city that there wouldn't, that there might be some kind of demonstration or, or, or something. And they were very surprised and very, very pleased that there was such a tremendous um, uh, turning out for the president that day. Um, when they were on Main Street, they, they came and made a uh, right-hand turn onto Houston and then made the, uh, that kind of fateful hairpin turn onto Elm Street. And it was on Elm Street at the very, very end of the parade route uh, that the assassination took place. It was just past Elm as the, the on-ramp to Stimmons Freeway and it's just down the road a little bit to, um, to the trademark. The, the, the motorcade was essentially finished at that time. Tell me some of, kind of the, the key things, that, the key lines, the key stories that Kennedy's remembered for. Um, 
Kennedy's presidency was, uh, was marked with activity. He was in office for just over a thousand days and he's often criticized that he didn't accomplish very much in that time, but, but, but his presidency was very active, uh, both, both in um, foreign and domestic affairs. Uh, there was, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and the Bay of Pigs. Um, Kennedy found himself at the height of the Cold War, um, and uh, most of his foreign affairs dealt directly with the Soviet Union. Uh, Kennedy is most proud, I believe, or, or he said he was most proud in his presidency of the uh, nuclear test ban treaty that he signed with the Soviet Union. Uh, he did go to um, Berlin uh, right after the uh, Berlin Wall was, was erected there and he, and he stood and made a uh, very emotional speech saying that America would support freedom uh, in Germany and, uh, and it's something that he's always remembered for, I think, that speech especially. Um, on the home front, he's remembered for his commitment to uh, race relations. He did go on television and um, kind of urge citizens to treat one another fairly. And uh, he did speak of equal civil rights, uh, which kind of paved the way for what happened after his assassination when Johnson led the Civil Rights Bill into law. Um, something else he's he's often remembered for is the the uh, the space race. I and mean, we were we were in dead heat with the Soviets after they uh, launched Sputnik, and and Kennedy uh, recognized that. And he recognized what an important uh, goal uh, landing on the moon was, and so he did make that that goal for us. He said that we would land a man on the moon and return him safely to the Earth before the end of the decade. And and by God, we did it. We did it in 1969. And uh, I don't think there's too many people that, that don't think of landing on the moon without somehow thinking about John F. Kennedy, even though it was six years after his assassination. Um, I think Kennedy is remembered for just, just his charisma in the way he spoke. It doesn't really matter what he talked about. His inaugural address, his famous um, speech where he, he says, and we are all mortal. Um, he, had a, he had a youth and he had a charisma about him that, um, that, that transcends years, it transcends time. People don't necessarily look at Kennedy and automatically think about the 60s. They think about Kennedy and they think about hope and they think about promise and uh, they just think about the man. And so I think, that's, I think that's what he's remembered for. He's remembered for the promise that he gave America, the, uh, the hope and the innocence of a time that was kind of shattered in a way by his assassination. That's true. I, I do remember that. Um, not only that, but immediately after September 11th, I mean, just hours, minutes within it happening, uh, as network news was taken over by this event, uh, anchors like Dan Rather kept constantly saying, you know, people will remember where they were today, just like they will when Kennedy was shot. The, uh, the parallels people would draw uh, to September 11th, it was just amazing. And yes, shortly thereafter, uh, T-shirts started popping up with, with Kennedy quotes on them. And it's amazing how you can take words from 1961, you know, and, and kind of transfer them to 2003. But that's just, that's just kind of the way Kennedy was. And I don't think if they were just text quotes you would do that. It's just the way Kennedy presented that material. It's just, it's the way he had about him. It's his, um, it's his charisma. Um, what was uh, the meaning of the term Lancer? Where did that come from? Lancer was Kennedy's Secret Service code name. Um, every president has a, a special code name that the Secret Service gives them. I do not know uh, where it came from, but I do know that that was his um, his code name that the Secret Service gave him. And uh, can you give me a general history of the Kennedy Memorial? Uh, immediately after the assassination, the uh, business leaders and civic leaders of Dallas started talking about, you know, how, how are they going to memorialize this, this president that was killed in our city? And um, the, the thought of a memorial was, was talked about, I mean, almost immediately. Uh, ideas were 
passed about, but it wasn't really until uh, architect Philip Johnson was brought on board that there was an idea that really solidified. Uh, Johnson had an idea for a cenotaph, which is this open tomb, kind of this concrete square structure uh, that he thought symbolized um, Kennedy's spirit being free and having no bounds, and also, in a way, closing out the noise of the outside city and giving people a chance to walk inside and kind of being isolated in their own way to, to focus on their thoughts and feelings about Kennedy. Um, the memorial was dedicated in 1970. It took quite a, quite a bit of time. There was a lot of uh, political hurdles to overcome and space was, a, was a, a critical thing. Do you put it in Dealey Plaza? Do you put it near the plaza? Um, that was, that, was a, that was a big question and eventually they decided to put it very near the plaza but not actually in it. It was put um, behind the old red courthouse where, where it is today. Um, the memorial was almost instantly misunderstood. Um, people just went up there and kind of scratched their heads and didn't really know what to make of it uh, because it's not like the Lincoln Memorial or the Washington Monument or the Jefferson Memorial. It's a, it's a concrete box and there's no fountain, there's no statue, there's no Kennedy quotes on the wall. It's, it's a concrete structure with a marble slab in the middle with Kennedy's full name etched on there. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, simplistic uh, piece of architecture, I think, but it leaves people disappointed and unsatisfied, which, which is a shame. Uh, the, the memorial didn't have a champion for many years, and it, it fell into a state of disrepair. It was uh, vandalized, and there was graffiti written on it, and uh, it wasn't until the late 90s that the Sixth Floor Museum became the custodians of that site as well. Uh, as the museum here and um, in 1999 there was a complete refurbishment done and a rededication of the memorial and now uh, it's a beautiful site it looks just like it did when it was dedicated in 1970 if not maybe a little better uh, and now there's interpretive signage out front which tries to explain Philip Johnson's original intentions for the memorial which I think helps it doesn't help that the, the memorial's out there kind of with no shade. It's out there in direct sunlight, and so folks are not necessarily going to, you know, linger and read a bunch of um, interpretive signage to figure out what the memorial's about, but it, it's what we have here in Dallas, and uh, I'm glad we have something. It's, it's maybe not what I would um, do if I was the architect, but I'm not an architect. Uh, but I, I, think it's a nice, I think it's a nice place. I've been over there several times. Um, I'm glad it's where it is. I'm very glad it's not in the plaza. I know there are many people that are upset about that. Uh, I know it's a, it's a bone of contention that it's not right there in Dealey Plaza where he was shot. But as a, as a historian, I'm very focused on keeping places the way they were. And when Kennedy was shot, there wasn't a concrete box in Dealey Plaza. When Kennedy was shot, it was exactly the way it looks today. And so I think the memorial is where it should be. It is very near the spot where he was shot, but we have maintained the historical integrity of that location so that people like me, who was born 16 years after it occurred, we, I can come to this place and look around and pretty much see what it looked like when Kennedy drove down that street and the assassination took place. Um, similar. Right. Um, John F. Kennedy was not shot on Kennedy Street. He was shot on Elm Street. And uh, that's an important part of the story. When you talk about Dealey Plaza and you mention Elm Street, people know. People know the world over. Uh, after the assassination, words like um, Dealey Plaza, Book Depository, Parkland Hospital, Elm Street, these words became synonymous with Dallas and the assassination. Elm Street is a big part of our history. And it goes beyond the Kennedy assassination. It really does. Um, no, I, I, don't think, I don't think we should do that. We, there, there is a small plaque out there that, that talks about the assassination and, um, and mentions that it occurred there. And we had the memorial across the street. Uh, I don't think there's any intention to hide what occurred here. I think there's been a genuine effort to maintain the integrity of the site. 
because it is a historic site and you can't go around changing historic sites adding statues and structures um, and this is just my opinion but I, I, I feel like that uh, to keep Dealey Plaza the way it looks and to make it look as close as it did uh, to its appearance in 1960 is extremely important. It certainly helped Oliver Stone in 1991. Sure, because if, if, there had, if the Kennedy Memorial was here in Dealey Plaza, it would have taken a, a great deal of effort on Stone's part not to somehow uh, capture that in, in one of his uh, meticulously recreated motorcade reenactments. Um, the, fact that the, the fact that the plaza was so intact um, helped. You know, when you, when you think about changing the street name or moving the, the memorial, to me that's almost, that's almost on par with tearing down this building because it would alter the, the, the structure, it would alter the, the integrity of this site so much. I think, it's, I think it's fine the way it is. I really do. Okay. Can you give me a general history of the sixth floor exhibit in the Cam Museum? Okay. Um, after the uh, Texas School Book Depository Company moved out of this building in the 1970s, it was bought by a, a private owner um, who wanted to put a JFK museum up on the sixth floor, but that, that did not happen. And arsonists tried to burn the building down, but that did not happen. Um, there was a, a, a real effort to tear down this building. Um, prominent Dallas citizens uh, worked to try to erase this from the face of the earth. They wanted to put the memory of the Kennedy assassination behind them, and expunging this building uh, was the first step. And um, I'm glad that um, cooler heads prevailed there and um, the building was saved. Dallas County purchased the building and uh, it became the Dallas County Administration Building, opened in 1980. Uh, the Commissioner's Court uh, is here and they, they, they meet here and have their offices here. It's a, it's a working county building. The first five floors are working county offices. And um, in 1980, the, the sixth and seventh floors were left vacant. They were kind of just storage space at the time. Uh, the Dallas County Historical Foundation was formed um, basically to come up with, with an idea for some type of Kennedy exhibit on the sixth floor. And it was a, a painstaking process that really started in the late 70s and it took something like 12 to 15 years to complete. But if you really want to get technical, it took 25 years because the assassination um, it, w it opened in 1989 on the, you know, 26 years, 25, a little, a little over 25 years after the assassination. It was a long time in coming. Uh, Conover Hunt was very instrumental in that, so was Lyndall and Adams. Uh, you also have to give credit to uh, Dave Fox and uh, Judson Shook, who was the public works director for Dallas County at the time. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people were very instrumental in this, not to mention Lee Jackson, who um, at his inaugural when he became a uh, Dallas County judge surprised everyone by making a, a statement that, that he wanted to see a museum put on the Sixth War. Um, um, the exhibit which opened on President's Day in 1989 uh, was said to have just been intended as a temporary exhibit but after a few years people would sort of lose interest, they would satisfy their curiosity and it would quietly close and the county would take over the sixth and seventh floors and, and everybody would move on. Um, that did not happen. Um, the visitor center had been constructed, the outside elevator shaft had been constructed. It was a, it was a semi-permanent structure anyway, uh, but attendance was just uh, phenomenal. And especially after Oliver Stone's JFK in 1991, attendance really skyrocketed. The assassination had a new audience, uh, essentially students, younger people became interested in the story and uh, attendance crept up to uh, close to half a million visitors and uh, the museum kept going. And around that time it went from becoming the sixth floor exhibit to transforming into the sixth floor museum and what that basically meant was we established a permanent collection of films and photographs, we became a real institution and uh, the oral history program was started in 1992 uh, which records uh, interviews with prominent people in Dallas, eyewitnesses, etc. And uh, 11 years after its inception, we now have 270 interviews. And um, 
it's it's become a, it's become a important part of the community, I think. And um, the seventh floor was added in February of uh, 2002, um, doubling the size of the sixth floor, ex uh, the sixth floor exhibit. And uh, it's now a uh, constantly changing uh, exhibition space, allowing us to bring in outside exhibits and also create in-house exhibits and um, constantly have something new and uh, dynamic so that we can continue to attract a local audience and have something new for visitors who maybe have come and seen the exhibit before. Uh, the, the seventh floor was um, really the, the, the brainchild of Jeff West. Uh, it was already well into uh, production by the time I joined the staff, so I don't really know too much about the ideas that went into its creation. Um, somebody else will have to help you with that, but um, I do know that, it's, that the seventh floor idea has been floating around for many, many years uh, with some opposition, uh, because, but it was basically just empty storage space, and it seemed futile to leave it that way when you had these the six floor walls crammed with with visitors and the assassination story is one that lends itself to a variety of interpretations and there's so much more that can be said and you can put the assassination into its historical context and whatnot and so the seventh floor allows us to do that the first exhibit the exhibit we opened with was an exhibit of Pulitzer Prize photographs uh, it was an exhibit that was organized by uh, the Newseum, which is a, a museum of the, of the news um, in Virginia and, and Washington, D.C. And uh, it came in and was very popular. And uh, essentially, it put the Kennedy assassination in its historical context. It had Pulitzer Prize winning photographs from 1942 to 2002. And among it, the, uh, the very famous photograph of uh, Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, the photograph taken by uh, Bob Jackson of the Dallas Times Herald. Uh, it proved to be a, a very popular exhibit. After it closed, we had a, a very small exhibit of uh, Stanley Tredick photographs um, taken during the Kennedy White House years, including the very famous photograph of John John uh, creeping out of uh, Kennedy's desk using that little secret door in the desk. Uh, it was a, it was a, a very small, quaint exhibit, uh, but it was it was very powerful. It had lots of unique images of the Kennedy. White House, and um, I'm glad we had that here as well. Afterwards, we had a um, our first in-house exhibit, the exhibit we currently have upstairs now. It's called uh, Warhol and Jackie, Artist and Icon, and um, it's an exhibit that was put together with the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, and it's essentially an exploration of Andy Warhol's fascination with Jackie Kennedy and um, the art that he created uh, in the aftermath of the assassination, the images of Jackie Kennedy that he created, and also the um, the uh, portfolio flash, uh, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, that he created in nineteen sixty eight. His his interpretation of the assassination in art, and also through uh, his his own version of AP wire copy. Uh, we, we try not to neglect it here at the museum. We've had the, uh, the Tribute to Jackie exhibit out in the breezeway for a number of years, uh, trying to always give her a fair share of the story. Uh, she was an iconic figure. At the time of Kennedy's death, she was just as popular, if not more popular, than Kennedy himself. Um, I remember footage of the, the Fort Worth speech that Kennedy made that morning, and um, Jackie was not with him. She was still getting ready for the breakfast. And one of the first, I mean, here was the President of the United States, and the crowd was asking, where's Jackie? And so, you know, how, how, do, you, how, do, how do you view something like that? Here's the President of the United States, and people are requesting the First Lady. Jackie was, was a phenomenal figure. Um, the things she did in the White House, um, the, the sense of style and grace that she brought to the office and the restoration work that she did with, with, the, uh, with the White House. It's, it's phenomenal. And um, in, in some ways her story might be neglected, but I think since her death there have been so many books uh, written about her and her keen sense of fashion and her sense of style uh, that, that I, think her, I think her story has been told.
I do. Um, back to the set of the floor, I forgot to ask about the ceiling and how that moved from... Right. Um, I, I don't know exactly how that came about. I do know that um, Roger Burson, who was the architect who transformed the Texas School Book Depository Building into what became the Dallas County Administration Building, uh, I, I do believe that was his idea. Um, the, the depository originally had a false ceiling on the seventh floor, uh, these kind of ornate tiles. And um, those tiles, either, either the tiles that were actually up there or extra tiles, I, I've never been able to find out which, were moved down onto the first floor when the building was open, and they, they are still out there in the lobby right outside the commissioner's court. And um, it's kind of a nice thing. Uh, Roger Burson's a, a very unique architect. He tried to use as much of the existing structure as he could, even if it meant kind of mixing things up a little bit. But uh, he, had a, he had a good uh, historical sense, and uh, he saw those tiles and wanted to make sure they were preserved. And at the time, of course, don't forget, the seventh floor was storage space, and no one knew if or when it would ever be used or seen by the public. So, uh, so those tiles were brought down and, and found a very effective use on the, on the first floor. Um, when did the museum start putting up displays like down in the lobby in the breezeway? That was kind of a precursor to the seventh floor. Um, while the seventh floor negotiations were being worked out and how we were going to manage to put exhibits up there, uh, the, the visitor center suddenly opened up opportunities, I think, for the uh, museum to explore other exhibits, bring in uh, organized exhibits from outside and create in-house exhibits because when you have an institution like this, when you have a real museum, you've got a, a wonderfully creative staff who are always full of ideas. And when you have an exhibit like the sixth floor with a very structured, balanced story, you don't have much room to start telling variations on a theme. Um, but you do have space in the breezeway and the visitor center and they recognize that. So starting really in the mid to late 90s, uh, they started utilizing that space. They brought in the um, tribute to Jackie, uh, which is an exhibition of Jacques Lowe pictures. Uh, Jacques Lowe was a Kennedy family photographer and those have been up for uh, several years. Um, there was, um, I believe, the very first exhibition um, was a history of this building, 411 Elm Street. Uh, we've also done exhibitions on Cuba and its unique relationship with Kennedy and how though that relationship with Kennedy continues in a way to the present day, to the Elian Gonzalez affair. Um, we did a remarkable exhibit immediately after September 11th. Uh, it was organized in, from, from inception to installation two months time, which is, which is really incredible for an exhibit. Uh, it was called Loss and Renewal, Transforming Tragic Sites. And it was a pretty popular exhibit, it was up for about a year. And it was our immediate reaction to the events of September 11th. Uh, it explored the transformation of these tragic sites, such as Ford's Theater, Pearl Harbor, Dealey Plaza, the Lorraine Motel where Martin Luther King was shot, Oklahoma City, it took these buildings, these places where something tragic had occurred, and it talked about how those sites were transformed into places of memorialization, uh, where people can go and see a monument, a memorial, a museum, and, and learn about the event. Uh, because it's a unique process, how you go from something tragic into something that's cathartic. Um, it was a very moving exhibit. We had, we had some remarkable artifacts on display. We had firemen's helmets from uh, Oklahoma City, we had a box of keys, just keys that were found in the rubble uh, at the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. We had a piece of the USS Arizona from Pearl Harbor. It was an intensely emotional exhibit. We had blood-stained um, reserved seating cards from the presidential box at Ford's Theater. Um, considering how quickly that was put together, it remains, a, I think, a great achievement of the museums, and I was glad to uh, have kind of been a part of that. I was still kind of a, um, a newbie in the um, department at the time, but I was, I was glad we all got to work on that together. Uh, the exhibit concluded with this kind of interactive component, this idea wall of sorts. We had all these blue notepads, and we invited guests to leave us their own ideas and comments about what should we do with the sites of September 11th, Oklahoma, uh, the Pennsylvania field, 
uh, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, and we got an amazing response. Uh, people left us suggestions, notes. They drew designs, intricate little architectural designs on these little blue notepads. In the course of a year, we collected something like a little over 5,000 of these note cards uh, that were just stuck up on this idea wall, and they're all in the archives now. And it remains a testament to America's creativity and their, their reaction to something like this. And so uh, I think that was a very successful exhibit that we had. Uh, it closed um, last November, and we, we now have a new exhibit in the lobby, uh, Dealey Plaza, uh, front door to Dallas, which is a history of um, Dealey Plaza itself. It talks about the founding of the plaza, um, the structures, the concrete structures out there that were part of a WPA project during Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, it's, an it's an interesting history of the plaza that most people associate with the assassination. And it's, uh, it's curious that um, there's a history behind it. It's, it's really the birthplace of Dallas. It's, uh, it's really its cradle and its grave, as I think one of the panels upstairs uh, says. Um, so we have that, but um, very soon it will be moving into the breezeway to make room for another exhibit. So we're, uh, we're constantly changing and, and constantly adding new things here. So. Uh, there's always something happening. Um, so what's your favorite of the uh, auxiliary exhibits? Um, that's hard to say. Uh, I would have to say it's, it's, it's a kind of a cross between Warhol and Jackie up on the seventh floor and the Lawson Renewal exhibit. Uh, I have very fond memories of Lawson Renewal because it was put together so quickly that our department really had to work together like it never had before. We were working round the clock, uh, living with each other basically, um, keeping up with each other, writing text, finding photographs and artifacts, and trying to tell this story, but at the same time trying to deal with our own feelings about September 11th. Because you have to understand we were doing all this in the wake of this amazing tragedy. And so we had all these personal, emotional feelings that were just going through us while we were trying to make sense of all this. I remember this one particular story that kind of puts it all in context. Um, I think it was September 12th, the day after it happened. I remember sitting uh, at my desk downstairs, uh, flipping through newspapers from November 23rd, 1963, these crackling yellow newspapers. And my assignment was to try to find stores that had closed the day after the assassination because we were trying to, I think for the news media, we were trying to provide them with some sort of parallel what stores had closed after um, the Kennedy assassination so that they could use, you know, form their statistics for what stores closed after 9-11. And uh, I sat there looking at these newspapers thinking to myself, my God, this morning I was looking at a newspaper that talked about devastation in New York and here I am looking at a paper that talks about the death of a president, and it's yellow, and it's cracking, and it's, 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 it's ripping in my hand. And I thought, 40 years from now, there's going to be a, a kid wearing gloves, sitting in a museum in New York, looking at this, this September, September 12th newspaper, thinking to himself, you know, what I'm thinking now. It's just this ongoing cycle. So that was what was going through my mind at this time. And so I think that's why that particular exhibit um, means so much to me, because it was I have so many emotional feelings wrapped up in it. But Warhol and Jackie, I think, I also enjoy, because it's such an ambitious exhibit. Um, we took the seventh floor and basically turned it into an art gallery. And um, that wasn't easy to do. And uh, it took somebody like Jeff West, who who has a theatrical background himself and who has the innovation to do something like that, um, to really create something which, which moves me when I go up there. I knew nothing about Andy Warhol uh, when I began working on this exhibit. Now I have a great respect for the artist and the man, um, and I have, a, I have a great respect for his, his fascination with Jackie Kennedy. And I go up there and, and wander down those 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 hallways, that kind of hall of Jackies that we have kind of put up there. And you look at each one, and each one is uniquely different. Each one has its own story to tell. There's one in particular uh, of Jackie smiling in the motorcade, and you think to yourself, gosh, that was just taken in the street below us. 
and here it is 40 years later hanging in this cold hallway transformed into a work of art and it really puts the assassination into context for you and it makes me feel like that that exhibition of Jackie pictures I think it's the largest exhibition of of Jackie's that's ever been put together it could only be done here it could only be done in this building and have that same kind of impact on you um, you also mentioned that the gold Jackie is being unique or as being a, a rare hungry well, what makes it set set apart here um, I, I, I have heard that the gold Jackies are a little bit rare than the other ones because I think Warhol used a special type of paint on that. Uh, I've heard, I'm not sure if this is official or not, but I've heard it was like almost a type of spray paint. And I know that those don't preserve as well as the others. And so uh, unfortunately those are, those are deteriorating faster than the others. They're, they're chipping and flaking a little bit. And so unfortunately, I don't think we were able to get as many of the gold Jackies as we wanted to up on seven. We were very fortunate, I think, to get two. Uh, and they are very beautiful. The gold jackies have a luster to them that I don't think the other ones have. Um, they're each unique in their own way, but, but the gold ones are very, very special. And uh, maybe Warhol intended it that way. You never know. And, um, also, the display you put up, you had a problem getting something from Germany. Fast. Right. We, we originally had a, a totally different um, picture uh, to uh, conclude the exhibit. Right now, I think we have the uh, 12 single Jackies on the wall, but originally we had one uh, single piece, which um, I think might have been 32 Jackies. Um, I'm not sure if that's correct or not, but uh, it was going to be coming from Frankfurt, Germany, and at the very last minute, uh, an unfortunate thing occurred. Their freight elevator broke, and uh, they were unable to um, get the piece downstairs. The piece, I think, was in... Was in, it was in pieces, but they couldn't. But it was so large that they had to use their freight elevator. There was no other way to get it down to the uh, the basement for packing and shipping, and so they had to turn down our request at, towards the last minute. And so we had to kind of make this emergency transition and 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 put up what we did. But I, I think it turned out well. I I don't think it's missed. I think what we have up there now, the twelve Jackies, uh, is a very powerful conclusion to the exhibit. It talks about the. It, ev it evokes the multiplicity that Warhol used when he displayed the Jackies, and uh, I, I think it's a nice, I think it's a nice ending to the exhibit. Can you tell me about the, uh, the importance of the switching tower and why you decided to, why the museum decided to renovate it? The switching tower, which is out here basically in our parking lot, um, it, it is an important, if peripheral, part of the, uh, the story of the assassination. Um, on November 22nd, there was a, a switching tower operator named Lee Bowers who was working in that tower. And um, at the time of the assassination, well, well a, few, a few hours before he was working there and, and he knew the president was coming, um, he later testified to the Warren Commission that he had seen a, a couple of uh, cars with out-of-state license plates driving around and he didn't he didn't recognize them he thought that was a little unusual they didn't park they just kind of drove around and left and uh, that got his attention so he was kind of watching out that window uh, towards the, the stockade fence area while well, watching for the motorcade uh, when the assassination took place he remembers seeing two men standing over by the fence I think about 15 feet apart or so and he recalls something unusual something out of the ordinary occurring there at the moment of the assassination. That was as specific as he got for the Warren Commission. Something unusual, something out of the ordinary. Now the interesting thing about Lee Bowers is uh, that was in 1964. Two years later in 1966 he was interviewed by a researcher named Mark Lane and he told Mr. Lane that um, uh, he saw something unusual out of the ordinary that could have been smoke or a flash of light. So. <laughs> He had, he had kind of added or embellished his story by 1966, but it remains an interesting story nonetheless. Lee Bowers was pretty much considered a very honest and uh, incredible individual. Uh, just a few months after his interview with Mark Lane in 1966, Lee Bowers was killed in a, a car accident in Midlothian, Texas, which has, um, has long been considered one of the many mysterious deaths in the Kennedy assassination. Uh, some people say he was run off the road by a, by a black car or he was drugged at a diner before getting into his car. But there's, there's some other more logical explanations for that. Um, 
Uh, Lee Bowers had a lot of trouble with his allergies and he took antihistamines and uh, those could have put him to sleep at the wheel or he could have gotten into a, a sneezing fit as, as I believe he often did and um, that could have caused him to have a car wreck. So it is mysterious that he died a few months after the interview but, um, but nonetheless he, he remains kind of a, a, a mythical legendary figure in the assassination and thus the switching tower therefore has this kind of aura about it. It has these conspiratorial undertones. Um, that's not necessarily the reason we chose to renovate it. It does have a, a part to play in the assassination uh, because it was back there in the rail yards and that was a place that police went immediately after the assassination. Um, it also is a part of Dallas Railroad history which is uh, an important part of, of the city's history in addition to the assassination. Um, it was sitting in our parking lot for many, many years in, in a state of disrepair. Uh, it needed to be restored, and um, I'm glad we, we undertook that project. Phase one is now complete. It just was completed um, this, this past year, uh, just a few months ago, actually. The exterior was totally uh, repainted and made to look approximately the way it did uh, the day of the assassination. Uh, the roof, I believe, was uncovered. I believe the roof is the original roof that was there in 1963. It had been covered over with another roof, a gray, a gray roof, and now the original red roof is back, back there. Um, the inside has been repainted to approximately the way it appeared in 1963. Uh, we hope that um, we will be able to go back there and revisit the tower and um, do something with the switching board that is there uh, and um, refurbish that or restore that or do something with it to uh, make it presentable. And there are all kinds of ideas with what we can do with the tower. Um, hold some kind of private functions out there or do some type of tours or just have an exhibition area out there. There's all kinds of ideas. Nothing really set in stone, but uh, the first thing we had to do was restore it and, and we're well on our way to uh, completing that. So. And then uh, the museum other things more on the plaza. I know I've seen some sketches of like kiosks and stuff. Right. There, there are a number of ideas. Um, there's, there's lots of long range uh, plans. Uh, so, so long range that I don't even know about some of them. Um, there, there are some ideas for some kiosks, some, some interpretive signage in the plaza. One of the problems we face is that there, there isn't really any interpretation out in the plaza. The only interpretation you have are the street vendors that sell their magazines. Uh, the museum focuses really solely on the content of the of the museum and we do have the windows overlooking the plaza so people can look out and they can use the uh, the FBI model kind of to to see where the where the shooting takes place it's it's kind of a good you are here um, device but really once you're milling about on the on the grassy knoll looking around there's not really much to uh, to see and understand and so that's that's a, one of the challenges we've always faced and so I think that's that's in our future is to come up with some way to do it until such time as uh, tours are, are are available or, or we can we can work something out around there we can have some type of signs or something. I forgot to ask you what you personally did on the 7th floor for the Warhol exhibit. Uh, for the Warhol exhibit I I did a uh, various tasks as assigned. Uh, a couple of research questions here and there, but primarily my main task was to uh, work on the timeline. I, I researched um, Jackie's uh, actions and whereabouts, and I researched Warhol's and uh, kind of formulated this timeline, which went through several people and many reno uh, revisions and things, but, uh, but my, my primary uh, focus was the timeline. Is there much of a debate over if you should put people out in the plaza to kind of compete with the voices of the, of the defenders? Well, I, I think that's a very interesting question, and it's something we've, we've long struggled here with. Um, the American Association of Museums had their annual conference here in Dallas last year, and that was the number one point that was brought up. The museum had a critiquing session where uh, these people came in and critiqued the museum and it was opened up, the floor was opened up to audience participation. And uh, that was the thing they talked about was the, the, the plaza is just kind of out there, it's this open void 
and you really have no interpretation out there, what are you going to do about it? Uh, it is an interesting um, question. I don't really know what we plan on doing. Um, I'm sure Jeff has more ideas. Um, Jeff always has ideas. But the, the problem is that visitors come here because they want to learn about the assassination or they want to see the place where it, where it happened. Uh, they don't necessarily know about the struggles that we have as an institution. They don't know about the differences between the vendors on the street and the museum. Some people think that we're one and the same. They think we place the vendors on the street to, to sell magazines and, and kind of usher people into the museum. It's, it's an interesting thing. If we were to uh, send tour groups out there, I, I'm not really sure what would happen. I, I don't necessarily know if there'd be confrontations or not, but uh, I know when I've personally led a couple of uh, private tours around the plaza that I've had a couple of uh, run-ins with, with some of the guys that sell the magazines and they're, they're not always very friendly to them. There's, there's many of them that are very friendly and eager to talk to me and ask me questions and exchange ideas and things like that. And many of them are just really nice guys. There's a few that, that aren't. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a unique thing. They, they do their thing. Uh, they do their interpretation of the events and, and we do ours. Uh, we try to tell a balanced story here at the museum. We try to present the, uh, the facts as they're available and films and photographs. Um, I think the folks out on the plaza have their own agenda. Um, it's admirable that they're so passionate about the event. It really is that they want to tell their story so much that they get out there in the hot sun every single day to sell their newspapers and to talk the story. Um, I've seen them out there with groups of people talking to them for 15 or 20 minutes and they have a passion about them that, that really is admirable. Um, I disagree with the uh, uh, somewhat gory pictures that they put in their newspapers, the, the autopsy photographs for example. I don't necessarily think that, that children should be allowed to, uh, to see those. We, we uh, made a conscious effort in the museum not to show gory material. We don't, we don't even show the uh, the last frames of the Zapruder film that, that show the fatal headshot. Um, so that's always a struggle. Um, so I don't really know where we stand on that, but, uh, but it's something that I think is going to continue to evolve and change, and, uh, and we'll have to revisit that sometime in the future. Dealey Plaza will always be here. It just depends on, uh, on how we look at it. Um, we'll talk about some of the uh, disputed facts. Okay. Assassination of the day's events. <laughs> Get my water for this one, okay. Yeah. <laughs> start with a couple here before I change tapes. What is the story with the alleged change in the parade route? Um, the motorcade route was not changed. Uh, that is a misconception, and um, that is one that is often told. Um, I believe the story of the changed motorcade originated with the Jim Garrison trial in New Orleans. Um, what that comes from is it comes from a, a map that was published in the Dallas Morning News that showed the motorcade going straight down Main onto Stimmons instead of making that turn from Maine to Houston to Elm. Um, there's been a question of whether the map was just so small that they didn't show those little intricate turns or whether there was just a mistake. The person making the map was just not familiar with the route. Um, the descriptions in both the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Times Herald always talked about the route being from Maine to Houston to Elm. There was never uh, any change made in the motorcade route. If the motorcade had continued going down Main Street, they would have been met with this concrete divider in the road and the motorcade, the presidential limousine would have had to go over this concrete divider in order to get onto Stimmons Freeway, which I just don't really see, see happening. So instead they, uh, they went down Houston and made the logical turn onto Elm Street. Um, I, don't, I don't think it was done for any, any type of conspiratorial purposes. It was not changed. And uh, was the driver changed? No, that's a, that's a pretty obscure um, rumor. I, I, I've never 
I had never really heard that before. Uh, William Greer was the driver of the presidential limousine, and he was Kennedy's normal driver. He was, I believe, the oldest Secret Service agent uh, active at that time, and that's been talked about and, and debated about for, for a long time. Uh, something else about the driver that's often been debated about is uh, whether he turned around and shot Kennedy. Um, that's based on a couple of frames of the Zapruder film where the um, the metal of the car, the little window frame of the car, uh, appears to show him turning around behind him in his arm, and uh, that's just that's just not true. I mean, uh, he, he did not turn around and fire a gun at the president. Um, William Greer was Kennedy's normal driver, and the only thing he might have been guilty of is, is slowing down upon hearing the shots. Uh, but rather than that being anything conspiratorial, I think that was just an involuntary reaction to hearing a noise. Um, eyewitness accounts and I think one of the films do show the brake lights briefly coming on the presidential limousine but at no time did the motorcade stop um, during the assassination. And uh, were shells found in any other locations besides this floor? Uh, yes and no. On November 22nd shells were found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Three shells were found in the Sniper's Perch area. That was all that was found that day and in the surrounding weeks and months. Uh, later on, I'm, I'm thinking uh, about 10 years later, around 1975 or so, there was a shell found on the roof of the uh, Dallas County Records Building. And sometime around there or, or slightly before or after that, there was another shell found, I think, somewhere over by the triple underpass. But, but the thing you have to think about about these, these other discoveries is they, they occurred years after the event. Um, not necessarily irrefutable evidence of, uh, of another gunman. Um, certainly interesting, but what you also have to consider is that by the time they were found, books had been published already which talked about conspiracy theories and there had been one that had already mentioned or theorized that there might have been someone firing from the roof of the records building and and then suddenly a uh, a shell was found on the roof of that building so I don't know uh, how it was found but to answer your question yes there were more than those three shells found in Dealey Plaza but uh, that was quite a while after the assassination took place Okay. How am I doing so far? <laughs> She's doing great. Okay. <laughs> Are able to be out there every day in the heat? I, I couldn't do it. I really couldn't. I can barely stand to be in the basement sometimes without air conditioning. Am I moving around too much? No, I think you're okay. Okay. Um, so, well, I as well, since you brought that up, the basement. <laughs> what else do you have, have of this building besides the sixth and seventh floor? Uh, besides the sixth and seventh floors, we have, uh, on the first floor, we do have um, our main offices are in uh, located in uh, Suite 120. Um, that's where our executive director has his office and uh, the marketing department is, is, is pretty much stationed in there as well. Um, but there's not room enough for everybody, unfortunately. Uh, we do have the visitor center, which is kind of a separate building adjacent to the, the Texas School Book Depository building. Uh, and that is where visitors actually enter the museum, go through security, and go and get their audio. And that's where we have the uh, museum store as well. And uh, down below in the basement is where uh, the interpretation staff has their offices. That's where I office and that's where uh, Gary Mack, the curator, he also offices there. And um, and that's where the major that's where the majority of the offices are, or is, is in the basement there. Uh, getting back to the questions of the actual facts. Have uh, in the Oliver Stone movie it says that the government the FBI brought in three or four marksmen and none of them could do the, the shooting that Oswald did. Is that uh, accurate? Um, yes. No, no one has ever been able to 
accurately recreate Oswald's shooting with his accuracy in that amount of time. Um, let me clarify that by saying that that's not to say it can't be done. The FBI, uh, the Warren Commission, the House Select Committee, uh, they brought in uh, sharpshooters to try and uh, replicate that. Most of them were not using Oswald's rifle, which might make some amount of difference. Uh, they could not replicate the shooting, but none of them indicated that it couldn't be done. And uh, chances are, if, if more tests were done today, it, it, it could be replicated. I, I don't believe it's impossible. Um, but no, uh, but officially it, it never has been, a, been, been recreated. So, are you saying that just the, they didn't get the three shots off the amount of time that they were able to get the target? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure the, the details of it. I, I can just tell you that, uh, that no one was able to fire off um, the three shots with, in that amount of time and, and maintain that level of accuracy with the headshot. And, The story I keep hearing is that his brakes were cut, or that he had a brand new car and the brakes failed. There, there's a lot of, of myths. Uh, like I said, Lee Bowers has become this kind of mythical figure of the assassination. Um, there's, there's all kinds of stories. There's a story that, that he was secretly investigating the assassination, that, it, that uh, he had one of his fingers cut off. Um, that I think actually occurred in an accident uh, unrelated to the assassination. But, but yeah, Lee Bowers has become a pretty, pretty interesting mythical figure. He was featured in Oliver Stone's JFK, um, and the illusion was that, that he was somehow uh, killed. Um, what I understand is that, um, that he had trouble with his allergies, and that might have played some part. Or it could have just been a, a, a fluke. I mean, he was in a car wreck, and we don't really know much more than that. It did occur a few months after his interview with Mark Lane. Um, he gave those two interviews. He gave a, a videotaped interview with Mark Lane, and he did um, uh, testify before the Warren Commission. And that's really it. I think that's why he's so mysterious, because some of these eyewitnesses have been interviewed hundreds of times over the years, especially those that are still alive today. Uh, somebody like Lee Bowers, you only have one or two interviews, and that's it. Um, so there, there, there's always going to be a level of, of mystery and intrigue surrounding those individuals. You say that, it reminds me of what you were telling me about the two ladies, the lady in red and then the other one, I can't remember their names, but... Jean Hill and Mary Mormon. Yeah, and what's the story of one of them who wants to talk to everybody and the other one doesn't want to talk to anybody? Yeah, Jean Hill and Mary Mormon are, are, are two interesting kind of symbols of the assassination. Mary Mormon took a very famous Polaroid snapshot of the, of the motorcade at the, at the moment of the uh, uh, fatal headshot, which has gone on to be debated and debated about whether or not there's, there's shadows or figures up in the, uh, the stockade fence area of the grassy knoll. But it's a very tiny photograph, and it's not in the best of condition. And so it's a very hard, it's a very hard thing to prove. It's a very hard thing to find because you're talking about a, a shape that's only you know, so big. Um, She's been reluctant to talk uh, since the assassination. She's maintained a very low profile, very quiet. Uh, on, her other, on the other hand, her friend Jean Hill, who was wearing a bright red raincoat that day, has been more than happy to talk uh, since the assassination. She's uh, now passed away. But um, she was one of the most vocal uh, people to support the, uh, the idea of a conspiracy of a, of a second gunman behind the stockade fence. Um, she did have red business cards that said, you know, Jean Hill, the lady in red, and uh, she wrote an autobiography, um, and there was talk of a TV movie for a while, and, uh, and so, you know, there, there is those kind of two types of, uh, of people, in, not just eyewitnesses, but in all types of the assassination. There's the, uh, there's the people that want to maintain a low profile, that, that saw what they saw or participated in what they did and just kind of want to forget and move on, and then there's those that want to I don't want to say capitalize on it, uh, but, 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 the, but they enjoy the attention. They enjoy being a part of history, and uh, they certainly don't mind uh, sharing what they know and talking about it. Have you read her autobiography? Sure, yeah. It's, yeah. Called, it's called JFK, The Last Dissenting Witness. The 
last one. The last dissenting witness. And so, I mean, how much does he really tell her story and how much of it is um, Jean Hill is an interesting figure because she, she changed her story several times over the years. Uh, when she was interviewed immediately after the assassination, she was very confused. She, she thought there was a, was a small dog in the presidential limousine, which she later changed. She thought that the flowers that she saw were probably the dog. Um, or the, the dog, yeah, that's what I mean. Um, uh, she, she's originally quoted as saying that, you know, that she maybe thought she saw something and that simply changed and evolved over the years to where she actually saw a flash of light behind the fence. Her, her story has really changed and, and become embellished over the years, uh, from what I understand. Um, like I said, Miss, Miss Hill's passed away now, and uh, she's left her, her autobiography for us to, to read. It's, uh, it's an interesting story. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not for me to say uh, how, how factual it is or not, but, uh, but I do know that she's changed her story several times over the years from, from, what, I've, from what I've heard and read of her statements. Uh, yes, we, we did an oral history with her, her co-author of that, a, a man named Bill Sloan, who uh, used to work at the Dallas Times Herald, and uh, there's, there's more information there. Um, but uh, I, I think that was in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. She worked a little bit with Oliver Stone on uh, JFK. She was kind of a consultant with him on that film, and uh, her book came out shortly after the release of JFK, because I remember Oliver Stone wrote, I think, the foreword to the book, so it was after the release of JFK. Yeah. So she's been telling her story for quite a while, by the time she put it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the other things that you've heard that are commonly misunderstood, misinterpreted, or flat out lies that get perpetuated? Um, well, the, the, uh, the Kennedy assassination is, is interesting because it's open to so many different interpretations and, and so many people come up with, with various ideas and the way they approach things is, is unique. If, if a conspiracy researcher uh, begins writing a book, usually they have their idea in mind and they gather evidence that supports their theory. Uh, the same goes for someone else who uh, is writing a, a book or, or an article. Uh, that, that tries to say that Oswald was the lone gunman. They usually seek out the facts that support their theory. Um, there, is, there is a genuine balanced chain of events, a story there, but usually it's, it's, you know, people take pieces of the story to formulate their own theories, and that's why you have all of these theories that, that the mafia did it, and the, the CIA, and that Cuba, and Russia, uh, because they're if you look at it closely enough and nitpick and speculate, you can, you can pick out pieces of the story that support your theory, but maybe as a whole it doesn't fit. When you put everything together, it kind of falls apart. Um, there's been all kinds of things. The, the backyard photographs of Lee Harvey Oswald is a perfect example of an ongoing uh, controversy, whether or not those, those photographs were faked. I, I simply don't know. Um, people say that there are crop lines across Oswald's chin that he's standing at kind of an odd angle, uh, that the, the shadows on his face don't match the shadows of his body. But there's been numerous tests done, and they've never been able to prove that those photographs are faked. So I don't know. The acoustical evidence is something else, you know. Is that a real police dicta belt recording of the assassination, uh, recorded on a uh, motorcycle that was, whose microphone was accidentally stuck in the on position? and captured the impulses of perhaps four shots? Or was it something that was recorded after the assassination and those impulses are really just radio pops? You know, these things, these things have been argued about and debated and um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, you interviewed the, the guy who allegedly had his mic on. Right. Mm -hmm. Who was that? H.B. Uh, McLean, he was a, a motorcycle officer uh, who was writing, um, kind of going back and forth between President Johnson or Vice President Johnson's car and the uh, press bus? He was further back in the in the in the uh, motorcade, about four or five cars behind the uh, presidential limousine, and um, 
in the 1970s, the House Select Committee on Assassinations um, accused him or, or implicated him that, that perhaps he was the uh, officer who had his motorcycle stuck, uh, uh, Mike, stuck in the on position and, or on the wrong channel is what it was. It was stuck, in, stuck on the wrong channel and recorded the, uh, the sounds of the assassination. But he emphatically denies that. He believes his microphone was in the correct, on the correct channel and, um, and he sticks by his story. And in, in an oral history that he just recently did with us, uh, he continues to stand by his story. And there's a lot of evidence that supports his claim. There's also um, some evidence that supports that uh, it might have been his, his microphone and that the sounds that were recorded were the impulses of, of gunshots. So I don't know. <clears throat> um, one thing I've forgotten before, so if you don't know, it's you know, but was uh, the vice president normally in his own car or something like this? Um, that's an interesting story. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's been some talk about whether or not the placement of the people in the car was based upon Kennedy trying to mend fences. I, I mentioned that Kennedy had come to uh, Texas partly because he wanted to mend the, um, the split in the Democratic Party. And um, Senator Ralph Yarborough and Vice President Lyndon Johnson uh, were not very close at the time of the uh, assassination. And um, it's been rumored that perhaps Kennedy made them sit together in the hopes that they would talk. Uh, um, there's been speculation or talk that, that Yarbrough refused to get into the car with Johnson and you know he was he was told that he was either going to get in the car or he wasn't going to ride in the motorcade so he did but um, but I don't know um, I know I know Johnson had ridden before uh, with uh, with Kennedy but uh, on the other motorcades in the Texas trip uh, Johnson had not ridden with Kennedy I believe Connolly had always ridden with Kennedy uh, kind of being in Connolly's state I think it was appropriate kind of as he was the host and uh, he was showing Kennedy around. So I, I think it was appropriate in that respect. Uh, do you know the, uh, roughly the distance from the sniper's perch to the fatal headshot? The, uh, the distance from the, um, the sniper's window to the, um, the spot on the street is about 90 yards, give or take. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dealey Plaza is much smaller than most people think. Um, we often get that. I, I hear that from everyone the first time they come. It looks so much smaller than, uh, than I anticipated. I think that's because they, they see it on TV and in photographs and they blow it up in their mind because it's the side of a presidential assassination. Thus it has to be this kind of vast open killing ground or something. But no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quaint beautiful little suburban-like park and um, something very tragic happened here but no it's it's a very small area and people are amazed that the, that gentle curve down towards the freeway is a uh, is actually a very small stretch of road the assassination took place within a very confined space and what was the time frame of the um, around six seconds give or give or take half a second or so but uh, approximately six seconds. Uh, approximately six seconds for what? Uh, from what we believe was the, the first shot to um, the end of the assassination, the, the fatal shot. However many shots were fired, but the entire assassination uh, was approximately six seconds long. Um, do you have any idea who the Nick Beef is in the grave next to Oswald? Um, nothing other than the rumors I've heard. So everything I say is uh, is subject to debate. Um, there, there. I do know that, that the officials at Rose Hill Cemetery, where Oswald is buried, they're they're very reluctant to uh, direct tourists to Oswald's gravesite, even today, 40 years after his death. Um, there's always been some concern over vandalism or or, or something. Oswald's very buried, buried in a very plain grave that's simply marked Oswald. Um, there's, there's been rumor, I've never been out there myself, there's, there's been rumor that, that someone purchased the plot next to Oswald and, and had a tombstone inscribed Nick Beef and um, that 
the, the, the rumor going around was that you could, you could ask the folks at Rose Hill, you know, well, where is Nick Beef buried? And that they would tell you that and that you would know that right next to him was, was Oswald. Um, I do not know if that's true or not. I've, I've heard that several times, but, uh, but I do not know if it's true. Um, Marguerite Oswald is buried there with her son, I believe in an unmarked grave. But, um, but even to this day, I think Rose Hill is, is pretty protective of uh, the location of Oswald's grave. Now, there are explicit instructions on how to find it online. You just, you know, look up the necessary sites, but, uh, but you can find it if you really want to, but uh, you're not going to find any help, I think, once you get out there. So, so is there a grave labeled Nick Beef next to Oswald's? Well, there you go. I, I don't know if the story is true or not, but and, and there there's you go. a blank spot next on the other side of Oswald's. That, that's, that's Marguerite's. I, I, I'm pretty sure that Marguerite is buried in an unmarked grave. Um, yeah, and then I, somebody told me the story that, that it was a comedian in Los Angeles who thought it was a good joke to put Nick Beef in there for some reason. But I think it was something better, but <laughs> um, in, in kind of uh, the general terms, you can talk about Oswald's mother and then his wife. Uh, well, to talk about Marguerite and Marina Oswald, you kind of have to know a little bit about Oswald himself. Um, Lee Harvey Oswald was born in New Orleans in a middle class family. His father passed away before he was born. Uh, Marguerite was a, was a domineering yet protective mother. She put her three sons in an orphanage because she didn't feel like she could properly care for them. Oswald was in the orphanage for about uh, a little over a year and then uh, she moved them all to Dallas. And um, they moved around frequently. Um, Oswald was never in one home or one school for very long. He moved numerous times in his, in his childhood. Um, they moved to New York, moved back to New Orleans. Um, it was, it was a traumatic childhood for him, I think. Uh, he <clears throat> never, never settled into one school. His grades were mediocre at best. Um, he was a lonely child. His mother never encouraged him to really be active in sports. She was always afraid he was going to hurt himself, I think. And um, so he just read books and, and kept to himself, never really had any friends. Um, it's kind of a sad, lonely childhood, really, when you, when you think about it. You, you feel sorry for him in a way. And... Um, Oswald kind of on his own developed this interest in uh, Marxism. He just kind of started reading about it and, and developed this fascination with it. And uh, inexplicably, he then joined the United States Marine Corps, which you wouldn't ex necessarily expect uh, someone who was a student of Marxism, who uh, had read uh, Das Kapital, to uh, go off and join the Marines, but he, but he did. Um, he made his uh, Marxist leanings pretty well known in the Marines. He did qualify as a sharpshooter, although uh, he did score pretty low on some of his practice examinations. He did score as a sharpshooter, which basically means he scored in the middle of the range. The, uh, in the Marines, you have three levels and sharpshooters in the middle. Um, he was a, eventually stationed in Japan. Um, some folks say he was uh, recruited by the CIA for covert intelligence work, but uh, we don't really know for sure about that. I mean, that's pure speculation. He was court-martialed twice in the Marines, uh, once for possessing an unlicensed handgun and once for provoking a, a superior officer. Um, he got an early discharge from the Marines and uh, defected to the Soviet Union. Um, that, that got him a little bit of press at home. Uh, he went over there and uh, within just a few days he announced that he wanted to uh, become a Soviet citizen and he uh, um, applied for citizenship and was rejected and uh, he responded by trying to commit suicide. He was um, just heartbroken. Uh, his dreams were crushed because, I mean, he had never really found acceptance, I think, in the United States and he came to Russia hoping to find, you know, his comrades and, um, and he found nothing. He, he was not accepted. He was not wanted. So he tried to commit suicide. Um, he was found before he, before he died and he was hospitalized and um, recovered 
and uh, he was extremely zealous, eager to, to show his uh, desire to, um, you know, he, to show his loyalty to the Soviet Union. He went into the uh, U.S. Embassy, he threw down his passport and said, I wish to renounce my uh, United States citizenship. But he was uh, told that he would have to come back the next day, or uh, come back on Monday, to fill out the paperwork. Oswald never returned. He never officially renounced his U.S. citizenship. He was apparently satisfied with, uh, with simply making this show. Uh, I don't really think the Soviets were very impressed by it, but uh, n nonetheless, they didn't really know what to do with Oswald. Um, they, uh, they set him up in, in, a, in a, the province of Minsk and uh, put him to work in a, in a radio and TV factory and, and put him in a relatively nice apartment. Uh, he, he enjoyed a, a pretty brief period of celebrity. He was an American defector, um, but he very soon became disillusioned with the uh, Soviet society he was living in. Um, he became uncomfortable with it, and uh, as early as, um, I think, 1961, he wrote to the U.S. Embassy saying he wanted to come back home again. But before he could work that out, he met uh, a lady named Marina uh, Prusakova, and um, fell in love, and after a whirlwind romance, they were married, I think, about two months after they met. And um, before they, and then, then it became a challenge of trying to get not only himself back to the United States, but also his Russian wife. By the time they managed to overcome all the political and bureaucratic hurdles, uh, they had a child, June, uh, a daughter named June. And so they, they did come back to the United States and uh, let, came back to Fort Worth. Um, because he had not officially renounced his U.S. citizenship, he uh, didn't face much of a difficulty. He came back and settled in Fort Worth. The Oswalds were um, kind of taken in by the local white Russian community there in Dallas. Marina was loved. Uh, she was a, you know, a, a respected person in that community. She found a lot of friends and she found solace in there. Oswald was continually becoming disenchanted uh, with himself and with the world around him. The, his Soviet experiment had not really worked. Um, he took all his frustrations out of Marina. He, he hit her on several occasions, she later testified. He refused to teach her English. Uh, she was kind of trapped in this unknown foreign world and she couldn't really communicate with anybody. Um, the white Russian community took pity on her, but she kept going back to them. They, they separated and reconciled and eventually um, her Russian friends just washed their hands of her because she would not leave Oswald permanently. Um, Oswald developed an, a fascination with uh, General Edwin Walker who was this right-wing extremist in, in Dallas. Uh, Oswald did not like him of course. I mean he had far right leanings and Oswald was uh, pretty much to the left. Um, it's alleged that Oswald did uh, fire a, a shot at, uh, at Walker. Um, two weeks after the attempt on Walker's life, uh, Oswald did move to New Orleans in the summer of 1963. He spent his summer in 63 with Marina and June and um, uh, started passing out um, Fair Play for Cuba handbills. He was the uh, All right, I'll, I'll, we, we have this room booked till one o'clock. Okay, I'll, I'll pick it up with the, um, the, the New Orleans. Uh, he went to New Orleans in the summer of 1963 and uh, developed an almost immediate kind of strange interest in Cuba. Uh, and he, he formed the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He was the only member of that committee. He started passing out these um, hands off Cuba uh, handbills all over the city. He got arrested for fighting with some uh, anti-Castro Cubans um, and he uh, he couldn't hold a steady job and he became further disillusioned. Uh, he uh, sent Marina back to Dallas and uh, took a bus to uh, Mexico City in the hopes of getting a visa to visit Cuba probably with the intention of going back to the Soviet Union. He could not get a visa and he made very public demonstrations at both the uh, Cuban and Russian uh, embassies in Mexico City and um, totally dejected, he came back to Dallas. And uh, shortly thereafter, he got a job here at the Texas School Book Depository building. 
Um, he and Marina were living apart. He had a uh, rooming house in Oak Cliff, which is a suburb of Dallas. And uh, Marina and June, and Marina was pregnant again, and she shortly had another daughter uh, named Rachel. Uh, they were living in Irving with a friend named Ruth Payne. Uh, Oswald would work at the depository, and usually on Fridays he would ride home with a co-worker and spend the weekend with Marina, uh, constantly trying to reconcile with her and, and just spending time with his family. Um, the week of the assassination, things changed a little bit. Um, instead of the normal Friday weekend routine, he uh, asked for a ride over to Irving on Thursday. Uh, he told uh, Wesley Frazier, the depository co-worker that he gets a ride from, that he uh, wanted to pick up some curtain rods that were there at the house in Irving for his uh, rooming house. And so he, he got a ride there, uh, surprised Ruth Payne and Marina. They weren't expecting him. And during that evening, he tried very, very hard to reconcile with Marina. He apologized to her and tried to get her to move in with him. Uh, Marina was, was adamant. She, she would not return his affection, and um, she would not move back in with him. And uh, Oswald finally gave up. He was very quiet. He watched TV for a few hours and went to bed early, earlier than he usually did when he was over at the Payne's house. Uh, the next morning, by the time uh, Marina woke up, Oswald was gone. He had left $170 in cash, most of their savings, and his wedding ring uh, on her bureau. And he had gone to the depository with a, a, a brown paper-wrapped package that he had told were the uh, curtain rods. He walked into the depository building, and, um, and that's what we know. At 12.30, uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. After the assassination, Oswald uh, left the depository. He was first seen about a minute and a half or so after the assassination in the second floor lunchroom by uh, Dallas police officer Miriam Baker and the uh, manager of the depository, Roy Truly. Truly recognized Oswald as an employee. Um, Oswald was, was not detained and apparently he walked out the, uh, the front door of the building. And um, he went, went to his rooming house in Oak Cliff. He, uh, Changed clothes, apparently got his, uh, his pistol, he had a, he had a, a revolver, and um, went off walking in, down an Oak Cliff Street. Um, about 15 minutes after he left the rooming house, uh, Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett was shot. Uh, Oswald was allegedly the, uh, the gunman there. Oswald was then uh, captured shortly thereafter in the, uh, the Texas theater, which was near the Tippett murder scene. Um, he did try to, he pulled his gun and tried to shoot a police officer as they uh, approached him and uh, he was ushered out of the building and taken to the police headquarters. He was interrogated and marched up and down the halls and that's where we have our, our film of Oswald. And um, he did have a midnight press conference right after he was charged with the murders of President Kennedy and the policeman. And um, he was shot by Jack Ruby um, on Sunday and he died at Parkland Hospital. And that's the, uh, he was 24 years old. And did his mother make burial arrangements before work? Or who decided, did his mother make the burial arrangements? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure who made the, uh, the burial arrangements. Um, there, there's kind of a, a short, interesting story about Marguerite involving the assassination. Um, Marguerite called the Fort Worth Star-Telegram the day of the assassination, and Bob Schieffer, who has since gone on to become a, a very popular CBS correspondent, he was working there at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram at the time. He picked up the phone um, and uh, Marguerite said, uh, is there someone there who can give me a ride to Dallas? And Schieffer said, well, you know, lady, the president's been shot and we're not a taxi service. And Marguerite said, well, I know the president's been shot. My son is the one accused of shooting him. And so Schieffer immediately went and picked her up and drove her to uh, Dallas. Um, Schieffer brought her in and, uh, and got her in there with the police, and Schieffer was able to stay for a lot longer than he really should have before he was ushered out. He kind of posed as a police officer inadvertently. Um, but uh, Marguerite, according to Schieffer, was overly concerned about her own treatment in history. Um, Ever, ever concerned about money, Marguerite was worried about how the mother would be treated. 
she said, they'll worry about the widow. Or, well, they'll worry about the wife. She wasn't a widow at the time, of course, but she said, they'll worry about the wife. They'll worry about Marina. They'll feel sorry for Marina, but they'll never think of the mother. She was worried that she would never get any money. Um, she expressed little concern for her son. Uh, in the years after his death, she always claimed that Oswald was innocent. She said he was an agent of the, of the, the government. She, she kind of fueled that. Her testimony to the Warren Commission is amazing. Uh, she goes on at length about how Ruth Payne was maybe paid for an interview, but she wasn't. And I mean, it, she was focused on money so much. It's, she was a fascinating person. Um, many people think that she was a little unstable. Um, judging from Oswald's youth, she was certainly domineering. Um, but you know, she was a, she's, she's a fascinating, very colorful character in the assassination. Marina uh, still is local. She still lives here locally. Um, and uh, she's remarried. She's now uh, changed her last name. And um, she doesn't really give many interviews these days. She's kind of seesawed back and forth as to whether or not Oswald was really the lone assassin. After the Warren Commission, during which she said he was the lone gunman, she's kind of gone over and said, you know, maybe not. Uh, I believe currently she's now saying that he had nothing to do with the assassination at all. He was set up. So it's, it's really hard to say. She's changed her story quite a lot over the years. She's been kind of accused of going after money too, hasn't she? Um, I have heard that. I've had, I have heard that she won't give interviews unless she's paid uh, a substantial sum. I, I don't know that for sure, but, uh, but that's what I have heard, yes. Uh, immediately after the assassination, um, in 1963, President Johnson um, assigned Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl, Earl Warren, to uh, lead a commission to investigate the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, the commission was a bipartisan effort. It included um, senators and uh, congressmen, including uh, future President Gerald Ford. He was on the commission. And uh, they used the FBI's uh, investigation kind of as a springboard for their own work and uh, they conducted an investigation into the assassination and uh, a little under a year later they uh, submitted 26 volumes of evidence and testimony and a one volume summary in which they stated that based on all of their uh, investigations their findings they found that Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy and uh, Officer Tippett alone. He was not part of any conspiracy and there was also no connection between Oswald and Jack Ruby. Um, the Warren Commission came under almost immediate uh, criticism. It was accepted at first but very soon after, within just a couple of years, there were books being published that criticized parts of the Warren Commission. Um, they accused them of trying to cover up facts. Um, the Warren Commission investigation um, does have some problems with it, certainly. Um, it was done very quickly. It was done as an immediate response to the assassination. Um, there's a lot of very good testimony there. I mean, if we didn't have the Warren Commission testimony, we wouldn't have, you know, some eyewitness accounts that, of people that have passed away, and, and what we have in the Warren Commission is, is all we have. Um, there's a wealth of information there. People who are quick to criticize the commission don't necessarily know how much is really there. There, there are some problems with it, and it's been overly criticized um, for 40 years now. Uh, as a result of all the criticism that had come out about the Warren Commission, in the 1970s, the House Select Committee on Assassinations was formed to further investigate the assassination, to reopen the investigation uh, into um, John F. Kennedy, and also investigate the assassination of Martin Luther King. Um, their findings were relatively along the same lines of the Warren Commission, based partly upon the newly uh, studied acoustical evidence. They did finally conclude that there was evidence of a conspiracy, um, that there were four shots fired, uh, and that one was fired, I believe, from the, from the grassy knoll area. 
uh, those findings, the acoustical evidence especially, has come under intense scrutiny and it's been criticized a lot in the years since then. But, but the House Select Committee in their final report did find uh, some evidence of a conspiracy. They did not name any conspirators other than Oswald. I believe it's relatively uh, normal in any type of government investigation for files to be sealed for a, a normal amount of time. Um, um, several of the, the Kennedy files, I, I believe, had a 75-year limit or so put on them. Um, the public outcry after Oliver Stone's JFK was intense, and uh, remarkably, as a result of that, the uh, Assassinations Records Review Board was established, and they worked from about 1994 to 1998, they had about four years there that they worked, and they went through and released thousands of documents, millions of pages worth of material, to the point now there, there are only a few Warren Commission documents that are still sealed, uh, very few, just a couple actually. Uh, the House Select Committee, um, there's still some of that material that's still, that's still sealed. Uh, it will eventually be released, I believe. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the vast majority of the material has been released. Not quite all of it, but the vast majority. And uh, can you tell me kind of a general history of what you know of Oliver Stone's involvement with the museum and the county and how that all came about? Oliver Stone first approached the um, Dallas County Historical Foundation, the nonprofit organization that runs the uh, museum here, about his movie. Um, and that he wanted to uh, shoot on the, uh, the sixth floor. His original intention, I believe, was to deinstall the entire sixth floor exhibit, do his, do his shooting up there, and then reinstall it. Uh, that was not going to happen. Uh, there was some very vocal opposition among the county commissioners and among the folks on the board uh, to his presence at all, I believe. Um, but. Oliver Stone, just like anybody else, has, has a right to, uh, you know, do a story, do a movie about the assassination, and so eventually he was allowed to uh, use the seventh floor, which was still at that time storage space, and he did a, a remarkable job transforming that into uh, the sixth floor of the depository to the point where, unless you really know, um, it looks just like the sixth floor. He really made it look uh, exactly the way the sixth floor appeared in 1963. So he, he used the seventh floor of this building. And of course he did all his uh, exterior filming out in the plaza. And he really needed no permission for that. I mean, the streets were, were cordoned off for, for his filming there, but um, it's a public park. He could do really whatever he wanted. Um, I, of course, was not here when that was occurring. But uh, from, from what I've heard from the people that were there, I've talked to many people that were here. And uh, even folks that were critical of his final film are quick to talk about how meticulous he was in recreating the assassination. He was a stickler for detail, and um, his recreation of the events in Dealey Plaza are by far, I think, the most accurate recreation of the assassination that's ever been done. Um, people said it, it, you know, eyewitnesses that were there that day that came for the shooting said it was, it was as if it was happening again. It was, it was that real. Um, he had the cars, he had the people, he trimmed the trees to their original 1963 appearance. He put more details in there than, than anybody would ever even know were in there. Um, but his attention to detail in the plaza was absolutely remarkable. And um, even if you don't agree with his conspiracy theory and his Jim Garrison angle and his final film, um, I think you have to give Oliver Stone some credit for his for his recreation in the plaza here because it, it was it was fantastic. And you've seen some less accurate. Um, there there was there 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 have been many um, film crews here over the years. In fact, shortly after Oliver Stone's crew was here, it wasn't more than a year later that the film crew um, for the uh, for the for the motion picture Ruby was here as a film about Jack Ruby. Um, and from what I've heard, that was a, a much less accurate uh, production in the plaza. They didn't put people in the right places and things like that from what I've heard. 
Just recently, a, a, a month or so ago, there was a, a, a crew here from, from Scotland doing, a, doing a, a recreation of the assassination, and uh, um, their reenactment was, was, not quite, was not quite right. The color of the car was different. Uh, it was not actually a limousine. It was uh, only a, it was, only, it was a standard car. The Connollys were missing. Connollys were not in the car. Um, and there was only one follow-up car and one motorcycle. But, but you know, uh, I, I, I've seen so many recreations of the, of the assassination over the years. I'm going to give some credit to anybody who at least makes the effort to come to this place. Because I've seen films where the assassination was done and there's a subway station across the street and there's people running out of a subway. And of course there's no subway in Dallas. Um, anybody who at least comes to Dealey Plaza, I, I'm going to give them some credit. Um, the assassination, I think, is, is something that's often recreated in films. And, uh, and to do it right takes a lot of effort. Uh, to come here is, is the first step, of course, because this is where it happened. What was the reaction of visitors when the BBC the Scottish crew was here? It's interesting. Um, they, were, they were enthralled by it. I mean, there were people out there with video cameras filming it, and they didn't know that, you know, they didn't realize that the Connollys weren't in the car and that the car was a different color and you know they didn't see the inaccuracies in it. They were fascinated that there was there was Jackie in the pink suit and there was the there was you know a car and there was assassination taking place. Um, I'm afraid that some of them got the impression that it's something we do here every day as if it's a as if it's a standard show like at Disneyland or something that you know every hour on the hour we have a motorcade run through Dealey Plaza which is kind of a kind of a morbid thought actually but um, but I think they got that impression um, fortunately that was only I think a one or two day occurrence here um, but uh, but it's interesting it does happen occasionally you never know really what to expect Kevin Costner occasionally drops by as he did a, a month or so ago and, and wanders about the plaza um, so you, you never know what's going to happen out here because it is a, it is a historic site, and it's a tourist attraction at the same time. It's a, it's a unique spot that kind of balances, balances that. It's been, it's been said that, um, I've heard it said that uh, the museum upstairs is the Smithsonian, and out there in the plaza is Graceland, and uh, I'm not sure how true that is, but I, I think there's some truth. Um, we, uh, there's, there's, there's lots of interesting people that come here. Um, I know that in the past Walter Cronkite has been here and Mikhail Gorbachev and uh, uh, Governor Jesse Ventura, among others. I mean, that's just off the top of my head. Um, I think the Kennedy assassination is such a global event that people from all over the world, you know, that they, bef before they die, they always want to see where Kennedy was shot. And when you think of Dallas, usually think of the Dallas Cowboys, J.R. Ewing and South Fork, and this is the place where Kennedy was shot. It's what the city is known for, and rather than trying to hide that, I think we try to embrace it or at least try to recognize it as a part of our history. And so what we've done with the museum is create a place where people can come and instead of just milling about on a, on a grassy knoll and and standing behind a fence and posing for pictures, we, we've provided a place where people can go and look at photographs and see historic film and immerse themselves in the culture of the 60s and really experience what it was like and experience the loss. People come here and some of them have a morbid fascination with the shooting and they, they want to see the Zapruder film and they want to see the autopsy pictures and they don't necessarily focus on what was really lost out here. But when they go upstairs and they see the films and they see the speeches and they see the man smiling, living, breathing, and then they go to that window and see what happened, they have this reaction. If they were alive, it triggers this cathartic release. If they weren't alive, I think it opens their eyes to something they maybe weren't aware of before. It doesn't become, it, it transforms the assassination from something more than this cool, action adventure film 
it makes it something real. It makes it something truly historic. And it makes it a moving, emotional, very human experience. And I'm glad to be a part of that. Um, people from my generation who uh, have grown up in a world without heroes, I guess, we, we turn to Kennedy in a lot of ways because he's become this legendary figure. He's become this iconic symbol for uh, innocence and, and youth. And you can, you can pull Kennedy out of his time and place and transplant him anywhere, whether it's September 11th or today or you know, wherever, you, wherever you want to put him. Kennedy is, is for all times in a lot of ways. And so I think that one of the reasons folks in my generation um, see so much in Kennedy and see him not so much as a human being but as this legendary figure is because he's been built up into this kind of iconic image. Uh, his presidency is not a presidency. It's Camelot. It's this mythical empire of King Arthur. It's uh, it, it wasn't that. It was a real time and a real place in American history with real problems, but it's but it's become something more. And if if that's what if that's how history deals with it, then that's okay. Um, I think I think history, America, uniquely American. I think we we have a way of dealing with tragedy in our own way. And I think we dealt with the Kennedy assassination by transforming his presidency into this one brief shining moment in American history, and. Um, making Kennedy into a martyr. And, and, and that's all right, um, because he, he stood for a lot of things. And what, what Kennedy means more than anything is it was hope that was never fulfilled. It was a promise that was never kept. And so Kennedy, for my generation, is that unfulfilled promise. And so people come here to see where the promise ended. And it's, it's still this kind of lingering dream that, that people want to believe in. They still want to believe in that promise that Kennedy spoke of. He's always going to be young. You know, you're never going to see old photographs of Kennedy. He's never going to have gray hair. He's always going to be this youthful, energetic person speaking about hope and dreams and America. And, and you're always going to reflect on that. And you come out here, and in a lot of ways, this is... Um, this is Avalon. If you want to believe in Camelot, then Dealey Plaza is Avalon. This is where the dream ended. And uh, so people come here and they, they see what they want to see and they take away from it what they want to take away from it. And uh, people from my generation take away something totally different than I think people who live through the event take away. And people like my, my brother, he's 10 years younger than me, he takes away something totally different when he comes here. And I think it'll be a forever changing thing. Kennedy will continue to evolve. He will continue to fit the needs of each changing generation. So what do you see him as a martyr to? Uh, he's, a, he's a martyr to, well, I don't necessarily see him myself. I think, I think the way he's perceived, he is perceived as, as a martyr to what was lost in America in 1963. People, people say that, you know, we lost our innocence. America died. You see all these kind of cliches, the day America died, things like that. Usually the subtitles of some television program, JFK, the day the nation died, the day the, the world cried, something like that. Uh, it was a watershed event. It was the day, I think, news media came of age. It was, um, it was a day a lot of people, including my mom, realized that there was that there was fear and uncertainty in the world. And uh, I think Kennedy's a martyr to all that. You know, in, in a lot of ways, if you want to believe in that, the Kennedy assassination was the end of the 1950s and maybe the beginning of the 1960s. You know, suddenly the Cold War didn't necessarily matter. We had, you know, the president was dead. I mean, there was something something tangible, something here at home, you could really, you could really worry about it. It was like, you know, people, people talk about September 11th and compare it to the Kennedy assassination. We have these memory books upstairs. Uh, we've had them since day one. These large notebooks with blank pages where people can fill in their thoughts and comments and, and, and remembrances of John F. Kennedy. 
and immediately after September 11th, all of these young people, these students, wrote these things in there which were very telling, I think. They wrote quotes and they wrote thoughts and they wrote things like, now I understand. And you think about that and you think, well, okay, now I understand. Now I understand because I've experienced loss. Now I understand because my country has experienced a traumatic shift in our perception. You know, we woke up on September 9th, September 10th, and everything was normal, and then everything changed September 11th. November 21st, the world was, you know, a normal place. People went grocery shopping, people watched television shows. Everything was normal, and then November 22nd, the world was plunged into chaos and mourning. And for those four days in November, um, people experience something that I think they will never forget and that they transpose onto future generations and they cause us to never to forget. Because folks that remember the assassination, they have this need, this desire, I think, to share their experience. It's part of the human it's part of the overall human experience to share what they, what they remember. It's a, it's a cathartic experience, it's a learning experience, and uh, it, it, it makes them feel like one voice speaking out in a nation of, of people that experience this event. And um, here at the museum, as part of the oral history program, I've kind of become the custodian of these stories. I listen to them all the time. When, when I tell people that I work at the Sixth Floor Museum, that's it. I will, I will learn where they were on November 22nd, 1963, and that's all right because I enjoy hearing their stories, because I enjoy providing them with that kind of cathartic bonding experience. Um, it's unique how a tragedy like that kind of brings the nation together. We saw it at September 11th, and I think the Kennedy assassination continues to do that when people come here. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. I've kind of gone off on a tangent here, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's at least my thoughts on it. Well, while you're there, um, I mean, it's like different aspects of the oral history, but can you give me kind of the general history of how that evolved? Um, it started with the memory books, just, just like the uh, September 11th thing. Um, when the museum first opened, the memory books provided people with a chance to leave their, their thoughts and remembrances. But some people, the rememberers, uh, were not satisfied with that. Um, they wanted to tell their story to a real person and leave it for, for posterity. They sought out museum staff members and uh, wanted to tell their story. This was back in 1989, the year the museum opened. And so borrowing um, Dallas County equipment, I mean, tape recorders used to take depositions upstairs in the district attorney's office. They started tape recording some of these interviews. And uh, we have a handful of these, eight or nine of these uh, precious, precious oral histories from folks that uh, were here that day or have vivid remembrances of the assassination. And um, that came to the attention of the, the people who founded the museum and, and worked to, to build the, the exhibit into a museum. And so as the collection and um, the expansion were being pondered, one of the things that came about was the oral history program. It was officially started in 1992 and the decision was made to buy video equipment, camcorders and such, to videotape these interviews because we wanted to um, provide facial expressions. Um, because audio tape will give you the person's stories, but videotape will, will show the emotion. It'll show the facial expressions. It'll capture the tears. And when you deal with something like the Kennedy assassination, you're going to have to deal with those cathartic tears because they do come. About a third of our interview subjects cry at some point during their oral histories. It's only natural. Um, they also show artifacts and mementos because the Kennedy assassination is something that people instantly latched onto as something where this is a historic event in the, in the making. We need to save these photographs and these newspapers and they kept them and they're precious to them. And so they'd bring them out and show them during their oral histories. And so we have, we have these things where they would show these um, newspapers and photographs and uh, mementos on camera. And so I'm glad that they, they were videotaped as early on as they were. And so since 92, we've been videotaping the interviews, doing anywhere between 20 and 35 a year, and we now have about 270. And we've interviewed um, some amazing people. Um, um, 
Kennedy's uh, press secretary, Pierre Salinger, his assistant press secretary, Malcolm Kilduff, who was actually here in Dallas that day, who actually announced that the president was dead. We've talked to um, about 25 eyewitnesses out here in the plaza, some of which we've talked to for the very first time. They've never talked to anyone else. We've talked to uh, Parkland Hospital doctors, uh, civic and political leaders in Dallas, the people who planned Kennedy's trip to Dallas, and then after it was over, the people that had to rebuild this shattered community here, um, that had to deal with this tragedy and had to deal with Dallas, the, the city that was suddenly labeled as this, as this city of hate, um, the city that was condemned by the world, the place where, you know, that's where you kill presidents. Um, we've, we've talked to a great many number of people who, who have some story to tell related to the assassination. School children traumatized by the event, uh, folks involved in the uh, Bay of Pigs, Bay of Pigs Invasion Force members. We've talked to a number of people. It's become, I think, the largest single archive of Kennedy assassination related memories on camera. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful repository. And we, we um, help students and researchers and documentarians every year. Uh, they come and research and they use footage. They use quotes from the oral histories and books. And um, it's, it's a good source of information. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to kind of manage that collection and, uh, and help to organize it. Tell me, uh, the guy who Woodrow Oswald to work that day. You okay. Told yeah, um, that, was, uh, that was Wesley Frazier, the man who drove Oswald to work the morning of the assassination. Uh, Wesley Frazier was a depository worker in 1963, and he became, in a way, Oswald's last friend. Oswald really didn't have many friends throughout his life. He and he and Frazier were really just kind of acquaintances, but um, he did get into this habit because he lived in Irving, just a few doors down from Ruth Payne. He got into this habit of uh, taking Oswald home every Friday, and of course he did uh, drive him to work that, that fateful day, November 22, 1963. Uh, Frazier is one of those folks that's very reluctant to give interviews. He's kind of um, um, sank back and not, uh, not spoken up very much. He's given a few over the years, but uh, he's pretty quiet. Uh, he did grant us, a, very graciously grant us an interview, uh, a three-hour interview, actually. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing oral history. Um, one of the most interesting oral histories I've ever done, I was videotaping the interview, and it was a very lengthy um, interview. So we took a break, and uh, during the break, the camera was knocked over, and um, the light bulb on my light broke. And I didn't have a spare light bulb. Um, when you do these oral histories, not at the museum, when you go out and do them in other places, you always take spare equipment. I had spare batteries, and um, spare tapes, and spare mics. I didn't have any spare light bulbs for the for the light. Of course not. That was the one. That was the one item I didn't have spares for. And so, in a in a remarkable uh, turn of events. The man who drove Oswald to work the morning of the assassination then drove me to Best Buy to buy a uh, new light bulb for the camera and uh, it all turned out fine and uh, we, uh, we got a great oral history from him and it's a, it's a remarkable addition to the collection. Um, sometimes we, we, we get folks who tell us a remarkable story that's almost too remarkable. Usually it's, um, I was here, and then I was there, and then I was there, and then I was there. They were, they were four remarkable parts of the story. Um, and you know, you, you check these things out, and sometimes it's as easy as going to a photograph or going to a film clip that maybe they don't even know exists, and simply not seeing them there. Um, we, we try to be very careful because there are folks I mean, not just here at the museum, but there are folks uh, out there in the, in the world that have that have given interviews and, and appeared in books and on documentaries that claim to have been in Dealey Plaza, and we really can't be sure if they were or not. I mean, we really don't know. It's kind of just their word. Um, folks that have never come forward, you know, someone can come forward 25 or 35 years later and say, I was that man right there standing there in the hat. And if no one else ever claims to be that person, well, I guess that person's it. Um, it's just it's just one of those things you have to deal with. You're, uh, you're it's just one of those one of those things. We've we've done some interesting oral histories with folks. Um, 
I'm, I'm relatively confident that most of the people we've talked to uh, were where they say they were. And um, of course, I'm a, I'm a trusting person. So you had some people who kind of pass themselves off as being something in the other. Have you ever occasionally that, somebody? Occasionally that'll, that'll, that'll come by. Usually it's, um, it's before they ever reach me. Then maybe you will tell a story to somebody in our security staff and security will, will pass that on to me and um, you know I'll maybe check it out a little bit and, and might not uh, might not follow up with it something like that uh, I, I can't necessarily think of any particular instance where somebody's actually come up to me and told me a story and I've just not believed it that that hasn't happened I'm not gonna say it's ne it never will happen but it hasn't happened yet How have um, people's memories kind of honestly um, well, that's that's an interesting thing. Um, you know, oral history, oral history in many ways is is this race against time because people's memories fade, and people people themselves they just pass away. We uh, we lose people every single year. I mean, we're talking about six seconds, forty years ago, and to remember the vivid details of that particular instance. I mean, it's it's amazing. I just did an interview. A a few weeks ago with the uh, Newman family, family that were out here uh, on, the, on the grass, the uh, closest eyewitnesses to the motorcade at the time of the fatal headshot, and they have a remarkable memory and have changed their story little, if any, in the 40 years since the assassination, but they're, but they're the exception, really. Most people will change a little bit. They might innocently, without even realizing it, embellish their story a little bit, add a add a puff of smoke or a flash of light as Lee Bowers did to his um, within a couple of years. Um, people just forget things. They start to blend events together. Uh, it does happen. As, as time catches up with them, um, things start to blur and they get hazy. And so uh, it's just, it's, um, it's a matter of time. It really is. The, uh, the Newmans were originally at Love Field that day with their two children, Billy and Clayton, and um, Bill Newman uh, got close enough with, with one of his sons to uh, see the president and Mrs. Kennedy, but uh, Gail and uh, the other child were not close enough, so uh, the whole family wanted to see the, the president, of course, so they jumped in their car and they knew the parade route it had been printed in the paper, so they drove down uh, towards the end of the motorcade route where they assumed the crowds would thin out, and they were right. They chose the spot uh, on the sidewalk um, on Elm Street uh, just before the um, uh, triple uh, underpass there and the on-ramp to Stimmons. It was, it was the very end of the motorcade. And of course, they, they stood in the fateful spot where the, uh, the headshot took place, right in front of them. Um, they recall a visual impact. They, of course, remember seeing the, um, the, the side of the president's head explode. Um, Newman immediately thereafter was taken to um, WFA Channel 8, um, the studios, just a few blocks over and put on the air, both of them were put on the air within about 30 minutes of the assassination. And Bill Newman originally said that he felt like the shots had come in the general direction behind him. He, he originally says the garden, uh, the garden up behind him, which you know most, most researchers assume is the grassy you knoll. When I talked to him just recently, he said that um, it was more of a visual impact. The shots definitely came from the direction behind him, but he, but he cannot specify whether it was the direction of the grassy knoll behind him or if it was the depository, because that was also in the general direction of behind him. So uh, he's not real helpful as far as where the, where the specific shots came from. He was focused on the president's car, and he, he saw a visual impact of the, um, of the shot. And of course, immediately thereafter, he said, uh, that's it, hit the ground, and they, they fell uh, on, on top of their children to protect them. And uh, there's been many famous photographs of them taken laying on the grass. They kind of became these uh, symbols uh, of the assassination. There's certain pictures that have kind of become these iconic symbols of, the, of that weekend. The Newmans laying on the grass covering their children, the uh, image of Lyndon Johnson being sworn in aboard Air Force One, um, you know, uh, images like that, the image of John John saluting 
uh, as his father's casket wheeled by on his birthday, no less. Images like that are seared into the national consciousness, and I think that's one of the reasons why the assassination story has endured, because we have these visual images, these people. Another one is the uh, image of Oswald being shot, that, that look of agony on his face, and uh, Jim Lavelle, the policeman in the, uh, the white suit, standing next to him with his look of horror on, the, on his face. That, that look of horror symbolizing the feelings of an entire nation as Jack Ruby lunged out and shot him. Um, images like that, these frozen snapshots in time, they really, uh, they really evoke images even today for me, and I wasn't even born at the time of the assassination. Can you tell me the uh, story of Zapruder selling this film? Um, First trying to get it processed. And right. Um, the story of Abraham Zapruder is, is, a, is a unique and, and fascinating one. Abraham Zapruder, of course, filmed the entire assassination from start to finish. It's the uh, color home movie that we've all become very familiar with, and it's um, one of the most famous amateur home movies in, in, in history. Um, he did not bring his camera to work that morning. His Bell & Howe 8mm home movie camera was left at home, and his um, receptionist, uh, Marilyn Sitzman, among others in his office, insisted that he go back home and get his camera because this was an important moment in history and he needed to record it. So he went back home and got his camera. And uh, he um, went over to Dealey Plaza to uh, film the motorcade as it went by. And uh, Zapruder suffered from vertigo. He had a fear of heights. And so uh, Marilyn Sitzman, one of the receptionists in his office, uh, offered to steady him up on the uh, concrete pergola there, the pedestal, and um, so he could get a, a bird's eye view. And um, when Oliver Stone was here in 1991, he said, you know, if I was a filmmaker here in 63 and I wanted to film the uh, assassination, if I knew it was going to happen, that would be the point I would, I would choose. Because it's just, it's a, it's a remarkable view. It's, uh, it's by far the best vantage point in the entire plaza. It's just serendipitous that he happened to be standing where he was and had a, a good steady hand to film the assassination. He filmed it from start to finish and never flinched. Um, it's, a, it's a really remarkable, haunting, haunting piece of film. Um, afterwards, he took his camera and, though shaken, he walked back to his office over in the uh, Daltex building. And uh, word got out that there was a film of the, of the assassination and, and a series of events eventually led him over to uh, the Kodak uh, plant here in Dallas and uh, they showed his film once. Uh, Zapruder saw it, and so did members of the Secret Service and FBI. And um, from what I've heard of the accounts of that, it was as if they were all just hit in the stomach. It was a, a wrenching experience to watch that the very first time it was shown on a, on a creaky projector in a quiet room, uh, not knowing what was on it before. We've all become somewhat callous and, and, and cynical as we watch it because we know what's going to happen but when you watch that film and don't really know what it shows, well you know it shows the assassination but you don't know how accurately it shows it or what it shows, uh, imagine seeing it for the first time. It must have been truly amazing. Um, copies were made at a nearby uh, film company, the Jameson Film Company, and Zapruder went back to Kodak and uh, they were processed there. Uh, the next day the uh, film was sold. Uh, amongst a horde of, of uh, journalists from all over the world trying to clamor to, to buy up that film. Uh, Zapruder sold the, uh, the print rights to uh, uh, Life magazine to a, the West Coast bureau chief, uh, Richard Stolle. He came in and Zapruder thought he was a polite young man and uh, he sold it for $50,000 and Zapruder donated half of that money, $25,000, to the J.D. Tippett family. And apparently uh, he never received a thank you for that uh, for that donation, and I think that always bothered him. We did an oral history with Marilyn Sitzman, uh, the receptionist, and I think she, she said it always bothered him that he never got a thank you for that $25,000 donation that he gave the family. Um, a little while later, Life uh, negotiated with Zapruder again to get the remaining rights, the broadcast rights in the Zapruder film, and that um, the final total for that Life magazine paid Abraham Zapruder $150,000 for the film. The film later went back to the Zapruder family, the right to it, and um, they later donated that to the Sixth Floor Museum, which is where it is now. We, we own the rights to the Zapruder film, and uh, we try to take good care of it, because it is a very important film.
somebody was trying to tell me that George Bush Sr. was the head of the CIA at the time of the assassination. Um, that, that is something, uh, that, that, that's that been a more recent um, accusation or, or a theory that's come out. I don't really know much about that. I do know that, that um, George Bush was not actually supposed to have any affiliation. He testified that he had no affiliation with the Central Intelligence Agency until I believe the mid-1970s. So of course, uh, according to him, he had no connection in the 1960s. There has been rumor that there was some memo that had his name on it or had George Bush on it um, in 1963. So there's been speculation that he was really doing some work for them then. I don't know about that, but of course, you know. Um, I firmly believe that as we progress and, and reach the 50th and 60th and 100th anniversary, that everyone who is alive in America will, will at some point be implicated in the assassination, uh, because that's that's just that's just the way of this. It's such a unique and and uh, convoluted story with twists and turns around every corner that you know you can find avenues to blame anyone. You know, you have you have you have all the presidents being involved. You have Gerald Ford on the Warren Commission. You have uh, Lyndon Johnson already being blamed. Richard Nixon was in Dallas just prior to the assassination. And now uh, you have George Bush. So uh, you have, you have, you know, there's no end to the uh, speculation surrounding the assassination. And, I, and that's probably one of the reasons why it continues to endure. <laughs> well, well, Clinton, uh, you know, met Kennedy at the White House. There's that famous picture of him. So somehow maybe he'll get implicated. I don't know. But, no. <laughs> I'll just keep telling the story the way it is. You tell me about uh, things that the museum's doing now, uh, the mass concerts and the, you know, the speakers that you have come in. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, of course, at the time we're, we're doing this interview here, we're, we're rapidly approaching the 40th anniversary in November. And um, the museum always tries to do something around the time of the anniversary. We each year have a, a legacy event, which is um, a special event we hold. It's a private event where we uh, invite guests to come and see um, some special speaker who uh, talks, kind of does a public oral history in a way, and talks about the life and, and legacy of John F. Kennedy. And uh, this year's no exception. We're going to have a kind of a symposium about the assassination. And um, in addition to that, on the actual anniversary itself, November 22nd, um, this year uh, for the 40th anniversary, the Dallas Symphony is going to be performing um, Leonard Bernstein's Mass, which was uh, the piece that Jackie Kennedy commissioned uh, for the opening of the John F. Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. in 1971. And uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. And um, in coordination with that, the museum is going to be putting a brand new exhibit in the Visitor Center. Uh, the Dealey Plaza exhibit's moving over to the Breezeway. And in the Visitor Center, we're going to have a new exhibit, which kind of traces the history of the uh, Kennedy Center, which is a unique history in and of itself. Originally started out as just a national cultural center. And uh, after the assassination, was named in Kennedy's honor. And it has kind of a unique and uh, interesting history there. And also talk about the history of uh, Bernstein's piece, Mass, which is a controversial piece that, uh, that deals with the, the Catholic liturgy and, and things like that. It's, it's been, a, been a controversial piece that's been uh, you know, talked about over time. And it's kind of finally finding an audience here, I think. So um, yeah, th there'll be a performance here in Dallas and then uh, exhibit up at the museum that should be up for quite a while. Um, in addition to that, there are um, some other activities. Um, there's going to be a new exhibit up on the seventh floor. Warhol and Jackie will be closing October 26th. And um, um, on the anniversary or around the anniversary, we'll be opening up a brand new exhibit called Remembering Jack, which is a, a large exhibition of uh, Jacques Lowe pictures. Jacques Lowe, the uh, family photographer of the Kennedys for many years. Um, all of his uh, negatives of the Kennedy family were unfortunately lost in the um, September 11th attacks. They were all stored in a vault at the World Trade Center. And so uh, all of his thousands of negatives of the Kennedy family were, were lost. And so all that we have left are the contact sheets. And so a, a publication called Remembering Jack is coming out, um, being published, that, that puts a lot of these pictures, a lot of the contact sheets in there. And uh, this exhibit is kind of being done in coordination with that. And so that's going to be on the seventh floor. Who owns those pictures? Uh, it's the estate of Jacques Lowe. His, uh, his daughter 
uh, who's, a, who's a good friend of the museum. She uh, helped organize that publication, and uh, I believe she's working with us to uh, help organize the exhibit. But, you know, the, the estate of Jacques Lowe controls all those photographs. Is the museum also involved in the Texas Theater? Yeah, the Texas Theater is uh, being being remodeled, and I think it, they're they're moving for it to become a, a real working theater again. I believe that they've approached the museum about possibly putting in some type of small exhibit or panel in the lobby that just talks about its its own role, its own unique role in the uh, events of the 22nd where Oswald was captured, um, because they recognize, of course, its historical um, uh, place in the story, and uh, so I, I'm not sure what will come of that, but uh, I know that there's been some, some talk about that, yeah. Hey, you mentioned Richard Mason being in town. You had uh, an oral history with that, right? We, we, we talked to uh, the celebrity greeter, I think his name is Walter Hagen. He was the celebrity greeter for American Airlines, and I think he met Richard Nixon at the airport. Uh, when he when he flew out, he he left, I believe, the morning of the 22nd, just a few hours before Kennedy arrived. He was here in town, uh, representing his law firm at a at a Pepsi Cola convention, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. Interesting. You mean like just that he wasn't actually here on a legal matter, or more of a sales pitch? It was a well, well, his his law firm, I think, represented Pepsi at the time, and so he was here representing representing them at a Pepsi convention. So you, getting back to you personally, do you uh, plan on staying with the museum for indefinitely? Um, I I think so. It's it's a part of my life. You know, the the assassination has always been a part of me. It's it's a part of my history. It's a part of the town I grew up in, and it's never been something I've shied away from. I've always been very open about my study of the assassination, and uh, I found uh, I think the the greatest outlet for it here. I think I can do the most good here. And I, I love what I do with the oral histories, getting to meet people. I meet people that I've read about all my life and suddenly they're sitting right in front of me becoming my storytellers. There's not a better job in the world. So how long do you figure before you run the place? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff might have something to say about that. Um, no, I, I, I really love the museum, and I, I love what I do, and I hope I'm here for a, for a long time. Uh, is this, how does it strike you that so many people now working for the museum weren't even alive when it happened? I think it's very interesting. Uh, there, there is a, a lot of us youngsters um, walking up and down the halls now. Um, there was kind of a a shift in the, uh, in the 90s where so many people who weren't alive at the time of the assassination came in. And, um, you know, I think it's unique. But of course, two-thirds of the, uh, of the visitors that come to the museum weren't alive at the assassination. We, we live in an ever-changing society, and um, the fact remains that more and more people, um, you know, are, were, are being, are, are, were born after the assassination took place, and uh, it's just something we have to deal with. It means that the museum has um, a responsibility to be ever-changing and evolving to meet the needs of a changing audience. Because as people evolve and change and as their perceptions of history change, so must our exhibits that deal with the presidency and the 1960s. Because you can't talk to people as if they lived through the 1960s if they were born in the 1980s. It's a totally different time and place, and to them the 60s is ancient history. You might as well talk about Kennedy as if he's Abraham Lincoln, because that's how far away he is in their minds. They just have more, more film clips of him. Uh, how much do you think that those film clips and television and everything kind of contributed to, you know, to making Kennedy such a presence? Oh, I think they're extremely important. I think I think so because um, Kennedy remains a uh, a sex symbol 40 years after he died, and I don't think that would be the case if we didn't have these photographs and this video of him. Um, I was watching film of him yesterday. You have to do that sometimes when you work here. I'll stop just for a second and say, you know, people 
think that when you work here at this museum that you're in a constant state of mourning, people kind of look at me almost in sympathy and say, well, you know, I'm so sorry you work here, as if like I'm, I'm constantly attending a funeral. That's not the case. We're, we're historians in a way, we're custodians in a way. We, we preserve a site, we preserve an artifact. This building is our most precious artifact. We take care of films and photographs. Um, we, we deal with this in a, in a respectful way. We, we have fun while we do it. It's not, I'm not ashamed to say that we have fun while we do our jobs here. We have a responsibility to history and we try to do it in the best way we know how. Um, but we're not in a constant state of mourning as people sometimes think we are. We, um, we have to put it in perspective. And in doing so, sometimes you have to go back and watch a film of Kennedy. You have to realize that there's more to this man than his death here on this street. He was, he was a real person and he had a presidency and he had a life. And I was watching a film of him yesterday and I was thinking to myself, my gosh, what a charismatic person. Even if I knew up front what I knew about everything, you know, the, 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 all the things that have come out about Kennedy since then, which, you know, is just part of our society now because you can't have any more American heroes. It's just not possible. Um, I would still vote for the man because, you know, he still moves me. He still sways me. I guess, I guess I'm still a believer. I'm still sucked into it. Um, I can't help it. I, don't, I, I think a lot of people are like that. I'm also a Democrat, so, you know, <laughs> that might have something to do with it. But, but yeah, I, I, still, I still believe in Kennedy, and I think there's a lot of people that, that agree with me. But if I didn't have this film of him, if I didn't have his inaugural address, if I didn't have him, you know, doing his, doing his hand and doing those, you know, making those gestures and talking the way he did, I don't, I don't think I would feel the same way about him that I do. What opportunities has the museum opened up for you? The, the museum has given me a balanced perspective. In a lot of ways, I came here a, a, a graduate, a, a liberal arts graduate, a history student, and I think I've been transformed into a, a pseudo-historian. I'd like to say a historian. Um, I came here with my ideas about the assassination, you know. I was a, a child of Oliver Stone. I, I watched JFK. I was susceptible to a lot of theories. I read a lot of books and, you know, you have to, you have to look at it honestly. You have the Warren Commission and then you have a stack of 300 conspiracy books. You know, one is going to be more persuasive than the other and there's simply more text there. Um, so I, I was leaning in a certain direction. When I came here to the museum, I found a perspective I had never seen before, the balanced approach. Um, the museum taught me very quickly that you have to look at things through a historian's eyepiece, that there's more than one side, there's more than two sides to any story. Um, I think I've found a lot of truths here that I, I wouldn't have found otherwise. Um, it's also enabled me to meet a lot of people that were actually involved in the story and ask them questions and preserve their story for posterity, and I think that's a very important thing. Um, I've called up a lot of people and tried to get appointments for oral histories, and, and some of them have cussed at me and hung up on me, and, uh, and that's okay. Uh, but I've talked to a great many people that I've become friends with in, in the years that I've been here, and, uh, and I'm proud of that fact. I'm proud that I uh, represent the museum in a way, and uh, in doing so, represent the community. And um, I also learn about oral history. When I came here, I knew nothing about oral history as a, as a type of, of, of history. And um, now I, I'm a member of the Oral History Association. I speak publicly on oral history. Um, I, I, I do these things. And, um, and I, I learned it all because of my experiences here at the museum. I'm a, I'm a self-taught historian the same way Oswald was a, a self-taught Marxist. Uh, I mean, more about you personally, your other interests, like writing? Um, well, when I was at SMU, I was a history double major with um, English and creative writing, and so I, I did a lot of fiction writing, and um, I don't do it so much anymore. Occasionally, if I get a really good idea, I'll put it down on a napkin or something. Um, but I've written some stories in my time. I've, uh, I, I have some other hobbies as well. Uh, I, think, I think all good historians 
uh, rather than focusing on history as a whole, they'll pick out two or three events that really truly interest them and they'll focus on that. But then they always have to have some type of wacky, crazy historical hobby as well. They have to have some you know, unique fascination that's utterly ridiculous like the history of bottle caps or something. Uh, for me, it's um, the history of wax museums. I'm, I'm fascinated by that, that particular piece of Americana is not really Americana. I mean, it started over in, <laughs> in Great Britain, so I, I'm being very ethnocentric by, uh, by uh, saying it's all American. But, but yeah, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by wax museums. I'm also very interested in uh, the sinking of the uh, RMS Titanic, another, another tragedy on a totally different scale than the Kennedy assassination. But uh, there's lots of little individual points in history that, that fascinate me. Uh, ironically enough, when I graduated from SMU, my, uh, my uh, honors thesis was about the Civil War. It was not about the Kennedy assassination. I wrote a 75-page uh, paper on the Civil War, and my professor figured I was going to pursue that as a historian. And instead, I came here to Dallas and, and focused on an event about 100 years you know, past that or in the future. But, um, but yeah. You were telling me that uh, Kennedy is more produced in wax. <laughs> yes, uh, in, in, my, in my reading on, on wax museums, I have found, ironically enough, that, uh, that John and Jackie Kennedy are, are usually more created in wax than any other celebrities in, in history. And I think that has to do with the fact that in the 1960s, uh, the wax museum industry was kind of having its boom. Um, prior to the assassination, there'd be, you know, the figures of, of Jack and Jackie in the in these museums and of course after the assassination the various memorable events often lent themselves to interpretations in these little wax vignettes you'd have um, you know a little wax John John saluting and Jackie draped in uh, in black or you'd have um, you know Jackie in in the pink suit and Kennedy at the airport or you'd have Oswald with the gun or you'd have Ruby shooting Oswald there's a there's a variety of, uh, of little scenes I've seen over the years that were created in the 60s um, the Kennedys and the Kennedy assassination were uh, were often produced in wax museums and I think that was just because there were hundreds of them in the 1960s today I mean there's very very few most of the uh, little mom-and-pop Museums have closed up, and it's it's mostly um, Madame Tussauds from from England. They've they've come over and they've put kind of some big places here in Las Vegas and New York. And there's a, another corporation that uh, that does it, but it's it's corporate run wax museums. All the all the the lovely cheesy <laughs> mom and pop museums with the really sad figures. They've all they've all they're all lost to the ages now, which is a shame because that's the ones I really like. I really like the ones that look nothing like who they're supposed to be. When they're really, really good, there's nothing to, um, to enjoy. Uh, tell me about the picture you have of Oswald, the Oswald Wax Museum, and you said that his mother had actually gone to take a picture of him. Right, the, there, there's one, I have a, a little postcard. The, muse, the museum actually bought the postcard. Uh, I found it off of eBay and, and had the museum buy it because it's, it's an important artifact. Um, there was, a, there was a figure of Oswald holding a rifle, standing amongst books, book boxes, that was produced uh, for a wax museum in Grand Prairie um, called the Wax Museum of the Southwest. It was a wax museum that originally opened in the 1960s over in uh, Fair Park and then moved to Grand Prairie. Unfortunately, the uh, wax museum burned in the 1980s. But yes, there is a photograph somewhere, I have seen it, of Marguerite Oswald taking a photograph of her wax son holding the rifle with the, the book boxes surrounding him. So I think that's a, I think that's an important, important piece of pop culture there. My, uh, my colleagues in the museum disagree with me and they think I'm, I'm re relatively strange for my, my wax fetish, but you know, we all have our, our fascinations and uh, at least mine's somewhat historic. You tried to get them to buy a Kennedy wax. <laughs> I wouldn't exactly say tried. I, I brought it to their attention that there was indeed a, a, a life-size wax figure of Kennedy that uh, was made in the 60s. It was, a, it was an, a remnant of one of those mom-and-pop efforts that had closed down and had been passed from person to person. It was sitting in someone's garage and um, he was dressed in like a tuxedo. And it was a pretty sad figure. It looked something like David Letterman, a cross between David Letterman and Peter Jennings. but. Uh, 
he was a, uh, a wax Kennedy, and uh, I would have gladly bought it for myself if I uh, could have. I think the starting price was about $5,000. The museum, unfortunately, was not interested. But in a, an ironic side note to that, um, Conover Hunt told me that in the original concept for the Sixth Floor exhibit, they had an idea for a wax Oswald in a recreation of the uh, second floor lunchroom. When the building was being renovated, they painstakingly took apart the second floor lunch area because it was an important piece of evidence. The lunchroom was, of course, where Oswald was first seen after the assassination. And so that was dismantled, and it remains to this day in storage for hopefully use later on. I mean, we hope to eventually put that back together again and, um, and have people look at it and see it as it was. In the original idea for the sixth floor, they were going to put the second floor lunchroom there and have a wax Oswald drinking a Coke. Um, they took around their little model of the um, sixth floor exhibit to various people to try to raise money. And they had a very tiny little wax Oswald. And uh, in the hot Texas sun, that wax Oswald melted into a big puddle of wax. And uh, they took it as kind of a sign from God that there should not be wax figures on the sixth floor. And uh, I, I, I feel like that will remain uh, forever the, uh, the credo here, so, <laughs> which is okay. I shouldn't mix uh, work and pleasure anyway, so I'll keep my uh, wax fetish just to uh, confine to uh, the, the pictures posted in my office. I have, I have a story that, uh, that I tell whenever I speak on, publicly on oral history. Um, in uh, 2002, we interviewed a man who was standing on the other side of the triple underpass, and he just he heard the shots. He didn't actually see the assassination take place. He had come out to see the motorcade. And as the uh, presidential limousine emerged from the triple underpass and passed him as they were getting onto Simmons Freeway, he said that the motorcade was uh, completely empty. Uh, Kennedy, Jackie, the Connollys, they had vanished. And um, he slammed his hand down on the table and said, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. He was emphatic about that, that the limousine was empty. He thought something had happened, something strange and, and sinister had occurred underneath the triple underpass. And, and that's, that, that was his story, and there was no arguing. And that was fine. That, that was his story. And, um, of course, that's not true. I mean, Kennedy and Jackie and the Connollys, they were in the car the entire time. I mean, there's photographs that, that show them all the way to Parkland Hospital. Um, but his story is unique. It's an important part of the collection because in the aftermath of the assassination, the world was plunged into utter chaos. Nothing was as it appeared. And his story, in, in so many ways, symbolizes that. It's an, ex it's an extreme form of misremembering, but, but it symbolizes the chaos that followed. Nobody knew what was going on, and that's a, that's a genuine reaction. The car looked empty. Kennedy was in the floorboard. Jackie was in the seat. It went by so fast, he might not have been able to see anything, but, but that's an example of, um, of a type of story we might get, of, of how someone can misremember the past, but yet it remains to us to historians to kind of figure out that story, to, to apply some sense of reasoning to it, and to try to make interpretations of it, to say, well, the world was in chaos, and, and that's an example of it right there. You uh, sat in when I interviewed Jack McNary, mm -hmm. and tell me, do you find a little discrepancy in his story? Mr. McNary's story is very interesting, and uh, I was especially intrigued by his um, vivid descriptions of the motorcade, uh, the, the limousine. Um, there is footage of the uh, Secret Service putting the uh, bubble top, or putting the cover, on the car. I have watched that footage. I've watched it since Mr. McNary's interview. I do not recall seeing anyone young, or anyone fitting his description, in that scene. I, I'm, I'm sure he was there. I'm sure he was near that scene. I, I'm, I'm certain he wasn't you know, deliberately lying. Um, it's possible he saw it happening and then perhaps um, kind of applied that to himself as if he was 
doing it. It is possible that he was kind of just out of the frame of the camera. I mean, there's a lot of interpretations. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, you know, reasons behind, behind it. But in the film we have at the museum, um, the only people that show up are identified Secret Service agents and Dallas police officers uh, putting the cover on the limousine. I know you can't give your personal take on the assassination, but do you find that most people believe in a conspiracy? And if, do you find most people believe in a conspiracy? Um, in the polls that are held uh, every year, it's always over 50% of the country still believe in a conspiracy. Um, I've seen numbers up into the 70s that 70% uh, believe there was a probability of a conspiracy. Um, the people I come into contact with through the oral history program, on the whole, usually are satisfied that Oswald committed the assassination by himself. These are usually journalists, members of the media, Dallas law enforcement. Um, they're satisfied. They're satisfied that the answer lies with Oswald. Um, so locally, in my own personal experience, I'd say most people are satisfied that Oswald was the lone shooter. But from what I know, on the whole, with the entire country, putting that into perspective, most people still uh, believe there was a conspiracy here in Dallas. And uh, can you tell me any, any of the wackiest conspiracies that you've heard? Not so much the position of shooters, but right. who would be behind it. Um, well, there's always been the theory that Lyndon Johnson was behind the assassination or Richard Nixon. Um, there's Cuba and Russia and Jack Ruby and the Mafia and the CIA and the FBI and the Secret Service. Um, there was a book that came out a few years ago, I say a few years ago, about 10 years ago, that said that um, the headshot was actually fired by accident by one of the Secret Service agents in the follow-up car. Uh, his, his automatic submachine gun misfired and the bullet went through Kennedy's head. I don't believe that. I think that's relatively impossible. Um, there's just, you know, Elvis has been tied to the assassination. As you mentioned, George Bush has been tied to the assassination. Um, I, I, I think you can pretty much find anything and everything. Um, when you start studying something, you know, slowly it starts to go off into two directions and that goes off into three directions and six and 12 and 14 and 18 and pretty much you have, you know, a million different, you know, the Kennedy assassination is the ultimate choose your own adventure. And I, and I, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way because it, it was a tragic event, but when you really start to look at the intricacies of it, um, I think Oliver Stone had it in his movie the best when he said it was a mystery wrapped in a riddle inside an enigma. Um, because what I know from my personal experience, the more you look at it and the more you study it, the more confusing it gets, the more uncertainties there are. Um, you start to look at characters and they start to be tied into other things. People have tried to tie someone involved perhaps in the assassination with the beginnings, the origins of the HIV virus. You start linking Kennedy and the HIV virus, you start linking Kennedy and ancient cults, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible and there's not enough videotape on earth that could, that could cover an, all the conspiracy theories and, and allegations and suggestions that are out there. That's not to say that it wasn't possible. It was, it's very possible that a conspiracy killed John F. Kennedy. It's also, I think, possible that Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy alone. I simply don't know. I simply don't know, and I don't think we ever will, and I think that that fact, and that's the only certainty, the only certainty is we never will know. That fact will keep people coming out here to this plaza year after year after year, looking around, walking around, looking at the fence, searching as if the answer is still here somewhere, as if 40, 50, 60 years later the answer to this greatest of mysteries can still be found somewhere out here in Dealey Plaza. Do you remember the person, the person who tried to involve Elvis in it? How that went? 
Um, there's there's a there's a, a website out there that's that's relatively satirical, I think, that um, that that has all these suggestions, they, correlations, things like that. Uh, I don't remember now, but uh, but I, I I have heard something about Elvis and Kennedy and the assassination. <laughs> So with your future plans, do you plan on ever trying to do something with your writing? Plan on channeling that into history books? I would, uh, I would love to write a book, but, uh, but I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm still pretty young, and uh, I know some things about the assassination, but uh, I, I'm, I'm an amateur. I really am. Um, I, I do what I do. I, I manage the oral history program, and I'm very happy with that. And I, I look forward to a, uh, a future uh, continuing to um, not research the assassination, but uh, preserve it, chronicle the story, and, and help future generations, younger than me, uh, understand what took place there and, uh, and try to help provide some balance in a world full of, <laughs> full of leanings one way or the other. I think that's what the entire museum does, and I think that's what every staff member here, I think that's what their ultimate goal is, is to provide a very balanced story. Uh, just to ask you a couple of my standard questions. On, uh, what do you think the world would have been like if Kennedy hadn't died here? I don't really want to, I don't really want to speculate on what the world would be like if, uh, if Kennedy had lived. I think it might have been different. I do, because it was such a traumatic event. Um, I think about my mom. When you ask me that question, I think about her as a child and the, um, the loss of faith that she's experienced in, in the government and the system. But, it, but of course, Watergate did the same thing. Um, I think if, if, if the Kennedy assassination robbed America of, his, of its innocence, as people suggest, I think that might have just occurred a few years before uh, it would have happened anyway. But, uh, but I don't really want to speculate because I don't think you can say what might have happened. I will leave that up to uh, the great science fiction writers who are constantly inventing time machines to send people back in time to uh, save Kennedy and create all sorts, of, all sorts of fiction there because the assassination lends itself to all kinds of interpretations in the science fiction genre. Um, looking at Kennedy in comparison with other presidents, um, how would you rate him? How, how would you see him in perspective? Um, Kennedy didn't have much of a chance, I don't think, to set himself up as a great leader. I mean, he wasn't Thomas Jefferson, he wasn't Franklin Roosevelt. Um, but that doesn't matter, does it? Because he still ranks up there in polls as one of America's popular presidents. His, his thousand days in office are still looked on as this mythical Camelot. Uh, he, he's going to always be remembered as, a, as one of America's greatest presidents. When you have the, you know, the classic lineup, it's always going to be Washington, Lincoln, Kennedy. You know, it's always going to be those guys. Kennedy's always going to be one of them. Um, again, I think it all goes back to his charisma, his appeal to the people this unfulfilled promise, this hope that he kind of left dangling there with his assassination. And I think the fact that he can be transposed out of his own time and placed into any situation you want him to be placed in, the fact that he can lend hope to situations today just as well as he could in the 60s, you know, I think that, um, I think that's important and I think that makes him a success even if his legislation wasn't necessarily, uh, um, even if he didn't achieve much in office through legislation. Um, one thing I forgot before is there have been, there's a conspiracy museum now, but there have been a couple of museums out there. Mm -hmm. Um, the, when I, re I remember as a child coming down here frequently, I mean, I've always lived in Dallas and uh, being always interested in the assassination, we would come down here frequently and like all the people, like the people out there today, I would mill about on the plaza and walk around the knoll. The only difference is back then in the uh, early mid 80s, I would gaze up at the sixth floor um, of this building and it would be just kind of this empty, this empty space. It'd be a dark void and uh, you know, there was no museum here, there was no context. Um, there was a place over in the West End called the JFK Assassination Information Center. It was um, 
a conspiracy oriented location. It was kind of Oliver Stone's, I think, base of operations during JFK. And um, they had a lot of books and uh, exhibits relating to the assassination. Um, there was that, and of course now we have the Conspiracy Museum, which is kind of a offshoot of that in a way, uh, remotely connected. I'm not exactly sure where, where that connection lies, but I think that there's some connection there between the two. Um, but I was very glad when the museum opened. Uh, the Newman family, Bill and Gail Newman, were actually the first people to bring me here, ironically enough. I came, I think, just a couple of days after it opened, and I was just fascinated by it. Uh, I was I was young, 89. Yeah, I was still um, still in elementary school, and um, it was just an amazing experience for me, because it, it really opened my eyes. I immersed myself in what was here, and uh, and saw things like I had never seen it before. And there's a there's a feeling. There's a there's the, it's the whole thing. It's the sights, the smells. I mean, even the smell of that floor is unique to that floor for some reason. I've often questioned that. I'm not sure what it is, but there's that there's that unique smell I get when I go up there. I think it's just me. But uh, but you go up there and there's just this feeling. There's this eerie feeling. There's this um, haunting feeling you get. And I don't care if you were born, you know, 16 years after the event like I was, or if you're born this year and come to the museum 10 years from now, it's still going to be there. And if you open your mind a little bit to it, you're going to feel it because it's, it's there. It's this, it's this unique feeling. Um, sorry, you have to move stuff out of here pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you can think of that I failed to ask? You've, you've covered almost everything. Uh, I, I'll just say that um, I do think Dealey Plaza will forever endure. Um, I know there's some people out there who, uh, who think that this does have a lifespan on it, but just like Ford's Theater in Washington with the Lincoln assassination, I think the Kennedy assassination, especially the unsolved aspects of it, I think will always lend itself to a certain degree of fascination. I think Kennedy as a person, his charisma, his hope, I think that will also draw people here. This is the spot. I remember when the time came for me to, when I, my internship was winding down and my supervisor said, let's go for a walk. We went over to the grassy knoll and we sat on the concrete steps out there and we talked about Kennedy, we talked about the assassination, we talked about the whole Camelot thing and I said, you know, this is Avalon out here, this is the place where it all ended. And. Uh, and I just knew, I knew Dealey Plaza would always be here, and I knew that I would be a part of this story. I didn't realize it at that point, but that was kind of my job interview. <laughs> my internship was ending, and, and they were thinking about hiring me full time, and um, that was my job interview. They, they hired me shortly thereafter. And um, so that was really the, uh, the moment that I, I realized that Dealey Plaza was going to be here forever, and uh, long after you and I are gone, there's going to be people, our children, our children's children. I think they're going to still come here, and they're still going to be fascinated when this is when this really is ancient history. Um, this is still going to be a place for people to come and learn, and see, and um, experience what was lost, and uh, and what we've done with with what was left behind. One last thing. I know you're passionate about keeping the record straight on. Are you a government? <laughs> we, we are not a, 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 a federally funded institution. We are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we run the museum through ticket sales and, uh, and things like that. We do not get any federal funding whatsoever, um, no matter what is said. <laughs> we never have been. And so you, have no, you don't have to answer to anybody? We do not have to answer to anybody. No one had any say-so in our content. We, uh, we do not have uh, CIA agents working for us. Uh, uh, we, we do not have anyone over looking over our shoulder to see what we're doing and what we're saying. We try to provide a balanced story, and that's what we always have done. And I feel like that's what we always will do. That's, that's the whole mission of the museum, and that's, that's the purpose we serve in the community. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.